there's been an awakening in the podcast. The po- it's the. Hey Griffin. Hi David. You you didn't sleep well last night. I didn't. I because I had a lot of thoughts. My mind was racing. This is um a Griffin and David present the podcast awakens. I'm Griffin Newman. I'm David Sims. Uh, with us as always is uh producer Ben Hosley. He's the right there. Hello, hey. Fennel. Hey guys. Um. So, did not see this movie. Sorry, Ben. I'm fine with it. I mean, I'm going to see it eventually. I'm not in a rush. Uh, but hopefully you guys have something to say about it. I have a lot to say. Uh, we're going to be talking today I about... I don't have any real thoughts. You can take this one. Oh, well, well, we'll swing. I'll say some stuff, and if you feel like anything pops up... Uh, I know you're not a man to, to really... Uh, uh, I don't dwell on films. No, you don't no, deep think no. on, yeah, yeah, on yeah. media. Um, no, here, here we are, guys. We're here talking about Star Wars Episode Seven: The Force Awakens. You and I saw it together last night. Mm-hmm. Now, for a little perspective, we started this podcast in March. We wanted to talk about one thing. It was Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace. And one by one, we went through every film in this series. Yeah, sequentially. Yeah, fo- focused on the um, Phantom Menace trilogy. Phantom Menace, Attack of the Clones, Revenge of the Sith. Yeah. Did like 10, 11 episodes in each of those. And have sort of breezed past um, the original films in the 70s and 80s because, it, you know, felt like uh, it been chewed up by other people. You know, there's, there's less to say there because everyone has their Of thoughts. course. Um, this is kind of the moment that, that we've been. It's true. Almost at first inadvertently, but recently we've been leading up to this. Yeah, and I feel like... Um, I, I don't know. Everything's viewed through the prism of, of this movie, you know? Yeah. In, in culture and, like, it, where it places itself. Now, now Ben hasn't seen it. We're going to get into spoiler territory. I mean, we, yeah, just, guys, we, we have right to up discuss the, top, the whole thing. If you don't want to know about this movie, if you haven't seen it yet, really, just don't listen. Don't listen. Just and wait the, until you've seen the film, so which that, I assume most of you have. Yeah. So that applies to, to Ben as well. Um, so you you're just, you can't. Be in the room. No, I'm I'm gonna leave, and I'm not listening or cutting out any of this episode. Yeah, so this is just gonna be it's raw. It's be raw. I mean, this is uh, Griffin and David raw. This is Griffin and David raw. I'm wearing a red leather jacket. Griffin is, is David delirious. delirious. I always get confused yeah. which one, which <laughs> suit he wears in which movie. Um, but what, we're each wearing a, a, a we're each skin wearing tight a, leather suit. Yeah, you're in purple. I'm in in red. Yeah. yeah. Uh, apologies and, in advance for the squeaking sounds. Ben won't be able to cut those out, but we're. It's nope. tight, lubricated leather. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Ben, any final words before you leave? And you're just going to sit outside and, what, read a book? Uh, I'm going to go. Get some lunch. We were talking about lunch. it. Okay. Um, you know, maybe have a quick smoke. And then you're just going to come back when we're Smoking's done. Smoking's bad, kids. It is bad. Don't do it, kids. Yeah. Uh, bad. And then, yeah, I'll come back and I'll, I'll be putting this out in the next few days. And uh, whatever you guys say, whether it be offensive or... I don't know. Whatever you guys do is going to be out there in the world. We're just going to be honest. That's all we're going to be. We're going to be honest. Uh, well, Ben, uh, a.k.a. Purdue Ben, a.k.a. the Ben Ducer, yeah. a.k.a. the Poet Laureate, hey. a.k.a. Mr. Positive, a.k.a. Hello. Patricia Ben Kenobi, a.k.a. That's Santa me. Haas. Yep. The Peeper. The Peeper. peeper. He's uh, a lot of things. He's a lot us. of things. A lot of things to us, but he is not a viewer of Star Wars The Force Awakens. So with that, I kindly say goodbye. Get ben. the fuck out of here, get Ben. The fuck out of kindly here, ben. get out of here. Kindly. Jesus. I Make kindly sure it's say, recording. I say goodbye, Fennel, to you. It's definitely recording, right? It's recording. This is yeah. People cool. are gonna be able to listen to this? Okay. Uh this see is a little weird. This is weird. This is really oh, weird. Oh Ben. Bye guys. Bye. It's actually yeah, because uh yeah. He's it's very comforting knowing Ben's right over there just uh, on the ones and he's zeros. He's our audience. He's our, you know, our voice of reason. He's, he's really- like looking three times. He's like triple checking that this isn't a fucked up decision. He's taking the emotional like look back over the shoulders. He's closing the reverse. I actually feel uncomfortable right now. This feels very odd. Ooh, I don't like this. <laughs> this is really weird. Yeah, we're without a, without a compass This right feels now. like Home Alone. <laughs> no. What if the wet bandits come in and attack the studio? Joe Pesci out of retirement. Okay, Star Wars, Episode Seven: The Force Awakens. Yeah, let's get this out of the way. We both like this movie. I really like this. Movie. Really like, and this you know movie. what? Uh, it's it's sticking nicely so far. Me too. Which is to me the crucial, especially with a movie like this, where I'm probably going to be so overwhelmed. Yes. While I'm watching it, which is how I felt about the prequels. Yeah. Uh, like that. I'm just you know I'm not going to totally trust my feelings on it for a little while. But like so far, as the fizz sort of settles. Yeah. 
You know, we we opened the bottle, all the fizz came out. Yeah. Now it's settling. I feel great. I feel I don't feel like I have to run into a Starbucks bathroom. Uh, I don't. I'm comparing my feelings on movies to my digestive system. Right oh, now. sure, I got gotcha. you. Uh, I'm I'm gonna derail this already. I just realized a little little housekeeping I want to do. I I just want to do a quick series of plugs, like rapid fire. You, yeah, go ahead. Uh, one of which is um, I'm gonna call up the opening crawl. By the way, oh great, to keep our fucking yes. streak going. Um, we're gonna talk about uh the role that diversity plays in this film. Oh, fantastic! Because it is important. But uh, Black Man Can't Jump in Hollywood, my favorite podcast. Great podcast. Love it. Uh, friends of the show uh, have already released their Force Awakens episode. They recorded yeah, one after seeing the movie us? last night. They, like, God went. damn it. I, mean, I know. Um, I saw that this morning on my yeah. podcast app, and I was like, fuck. Fucking We're... Braylock. <laughs> and he was, he was talking shit to me on Twitter this morning. I love you, Jonathan. And he's got great hair. Love you, Jonathan Braylock. John Braylock's the best. Um, one of the hosts. Uh, it, yeah. So we're going to talk about diversity, but those guys. They, what a great, yeah. Yes. Listen to those guys. They they're have not a lot white of wonderful men. things to say. They, yeah. they're, they're the voices you should listen to on the matter. I highly recommend that episode. Uh, additional plugs. I, I teased that I was going to do this like six weeks ago and then just forgot to do it. Uh, Avery Edison, another friend of the show, has a great podcast. I love you, Avery. You're the greatest. One of our earliest fans. Yes. Uh, Swings and Roundabouts. I at one point said I'm going to listen to that next week and probably plug it. And then I listened to it and have loved it and have not plugged it. She's on episode three now. It's really good. Uh, it's a great podcast. She uh, uses like Mac and Talk on her computer to mm-hmm. pretend to be her therapist and does written therapy sessions with a computer. Um, great. Love it. Uh, the thing that reminded me, because you said uh, Fizz, I don't know if you know this, uh, another long dormant franchise that's coming back uh, to the light, Fizzy Boys. Oh, One of our favorite podcasts. So excited. Chris Gethard, Boys. friend of the Has show. Has it posted yet? Guest. They just recorded. I don't think it's posted yeah. yet. Uh, Fizzy Boys, which is a soda podcast. Uh, Chris Gethard, Don Finelli. Listen to that. Uh, that's it for podcast plugs. One final thing that I want to say. I have a show coming up Wednesday, December 23rd. Oh, yeah, a live show. A live show that I am hosting and producing with my good old buddy, Joe Garden. We love him. Former features editor for The Onion, one of their original writers. Love him. Uh, it's a, uh, the Griff and Joe a Christmas Spectacular and to a lesser degree Hanukkah Spectacular. Uh, it's going <laughs> to be a dueling be. holiday special of us trying to represent our respective holidays. Great guests, including comedians. Brett Davis, Ray Sani, Liam McEnany, Bronwyn Ariel Isaac, uh, ventriloquist Nigel Dr. Dell Dunkley, who I'll say is a guy I saw on a subway station platform and booked to do a show, and uh, Frankie Cosmos, who's like a great uh, musician. Uh, Union Hall, I believe 8 o'clock, Wednesday, December 23rd. Please come to that show. Uh, I want to plug uh, The Atlantic, where I write. That's it. Storied establishment. Yep, founded by Ralph Waldo Emerson, among others, and now I write Star Wars nonsense on that website, Keeping the among other alive. things. You wrote a great uh, Admiral Piat article, I which I, was, I think we already plugged was, was in the last episode. It. Okay, so I just want to say before, I don't want people reading into, because this is a podcast where I've been known to get very effusive at times, you know? Yeah, Either sure. overly angry, overly excited. Mm-hmm. I'm going to try to be a little tempered in this yeah, episode. Yeah, yeah. I don't want people reading into it like, oh, between the lines, I think he's disappointed. Well, but, oh, yeah, sure. I'm trying ahead, to just right. be objective. I'm trying to be level-headed with this because it's it's hard to reconcile with this movie. I mean, it's hard to believe that we've seen it. For so long, it, like, existed as this, like, mirage. Yeah. You know? I still don't fo- totally get that I've seen it. If that makes sense. Right. I, I need to see it again. I feel the same way. I'm also. Like I'm, when it was happening, like, you know, it's that thing where your brain's just like kind of slips into some sort of low battery mode where you're just like. Yes. Oh, this is too much to think about right now. All right. All right. All right. All right. Almost like down, what happens down, to R2-D2 where you just sit back. Yeah. And you let just go into low power around. mode. Um, I, our, uh, Until my, the end of the movie happened. My friend John Henry, who happened to be in the same screening as us uh, last night, we got drinks after the movie and we were saying that like, um. When you're watching the movie, it's something happening to you, so you can just kind of, like, succumb to it. Yeah. But to actually think Which about it— Which is also Abrams' specialty. These movies that kind of you just have to succumb to and let them kind of drag you along. He's like a real showman, you know? He's, like, giving you a lot of show, and he's, like, keeping the ball in the air and moving things fast. Mm-hmm. Um, we're saying it's much more difficult to have seen it and deal with it as, like, memories in your head and have to actively, like, pull apart those memories, you know? But we both liked this movie a lot. Yeah. My biggest really thing is, liked it. Really liked it. And I like 
I mean, can speak for both of us because I was checking in with you just visually a lot throughout the movie. We were both like grinning like idiots. I was grinning a lot. G- giggling. Giggling a lot. Was yeah. pretty quiet. With nice, nice audience cheered at all the right moments, but didn't go berserk. We saw it at the AMC 25 in yeah. Times Square, what 7 a o'clock. What shit show. 2D. I do not plug seeing anything at the AMC 25. Let's unplug the AMC Fuck 25. Fuck that theater. The most successful movie theater in the world was not prepared. They were baffled. baffled. I showed up like three hours early. Okay. They, they thought everyone was online for Krampus. Okay, it's a lot. Three hours is a lot. I show up yeah. and there's maybe a handful of other people like me. And the pe- the, the guy's just like, Oh, but your your movie's at seven. Like I can't let you in for a while. It's and I'm the like, biggest movie buddy, of all time. Like you realize you sold out like every screening of this goddamn thing, right? You realize that uh, you're not closing for the next seventy two hours. They're I doing say, like four a.m. screenings. I felt very bad for the ticket takers and the the various sort of like workers at AMC who obviously had not been given like a blueprint like a game plan the manager's fucked up yeah exactly i had like a 40 minute concession stand line where when i got on the line i was fifth on the line it took 40 minutes for me to get from fifth to first and like as that happened the line grew to be like literally a hundred people on one of six lines and this is like that ever makes sense to me because we know that's where movie theaters make their money so why don't you have like eight people at the concession stand on a on a star wars day yeah you know what's really annoying it was like, I love that we're just talking this oh much God, about oh the theater's God. mismanagement. Well, we have, you know what? We don't have a time limit on this. We could talk about whatever yeah. we want. Um, they, w- there were two people who were just very slowly with no urgency uh, loading popcorn into the bags and then putting them on that little, like in the little glass case where they like stay heated under the <laughs> heat lamp. And then no one was selling the popcorn bags. No one wants those bags anyway, by the way. I hate heat lamp popcorn. But people were saying like, hey, can no, I get some I get it, popcorn, I get please? Yeah. And they were like, uh, one hold second, on a second. One second and someone's to... putting the popcorn in the bag and they're not selling it. <laughs> All right. We are very much off track. Okay. We got there. Seven o'clock. <sighs> Waited in line for a bunch. pretty much. There are like four screens that aren't playing The Force Awakens. Yeah. There was Krampus, like you say. Krampus. There was some Krampus. Which, action. by the way, I'll plug Krampus. I liked it. Cool. I hope this is our pluggiest episode ever. Oh, so many plugs. Um. But uh, we we saw it in one of the smaller screens. Yeah, I mean, it was a fine screen, but fine you know, screen. not 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 your sort of blown out IMAX type screen. But it definitely kind of felt like we were the latchkey kids, you know, like all the a cool kids were at their IMAX 3D screening, and we were like, let's just we're in this together. We were like our we we're theater 16 for whatever reason they didn't let us go up until much later. Like it no, felt like we were so all annoying. in it together. Wow, we're really griping about this. I know, but our crowd liked it a lot. I'm saying we just had like this. Well, it was a bad news bears theater. Everyone was very happy to be yeah. there. Everyone was very pumped. Yes, and but like what I liked was like you know they cheered and clapped at the you know at the sort of cheer and clap moments where the movie's almost giving you a second. Yeah, but they weren't just the whole time being like, oh my god, right. Star Wars is up. Yeah. Well, and it also felt like. You know, what I'm not going to do on this episode is say, this is the best one yet. <laughs> no, no. A, because it isn't. No. But B, it's also because I'm so guarded because of the fact that I saw all three of those movies and thought they were great at the time. Yeah, me too. I think this is going to hold up, but you don't know. You don't know, but I think it's going to hold up better. A hundred percent. Yeah. I, I feel like objectively, I'm also an adult now, you know? That's the thing. And everyone's sort of coming at me being like, hey man, everybody liked Phantom at the time. And it's like... You know, that was a different time. Yes. And critics, the critics who liked Phantom in general, didn't care about Star Wars that much. No, they were just like, this movie's big. Yeah, and like, they were like, look, he made another one of them, and it's got all the bleeps and bloops. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know, I guess it's good. Like, you know, I feel like the critical reaction to Phantom Menace, critics, I'm talking about yeah. film critics, yeah. who were generally kind of gave it a pass. You know, it's not like it was getting raves, but it got like a, yeah, sure. You know, they were a slightly older generation. They didn't care about uh, Star Wars in the same way. Yeah, the critics we have now are people who grew up on Star Wars, yeah. like yourself. Uh, well, but forget me. Like, even people who are older than me, even, like... Watch the original films yeah. in theaters. Yeah. Yeah. It's um, a different vibe. Here's um, a big thing that I think shifted, too. I think as the bloom came off the rose with Phantom Menace and following that, Attack the Clones yeah. and Revenge of the Sith... Yeah. In these 10 years where there was not a Star Wars movie, save for Clone Wars. Let's not talk about it. Um, they, uh, I feel like as a culture, not just like the hyper nerds, but as a culture, there was a mainstreaming of studying the semiotics of sure. those movies. Yeah, the original movies. You know, because yeah. people sort of were really, much like us, trying to figure out why do these work? 
and these tones. Yeah, why did they endure? Why did the prequels m- not make sense? Like, yeah. Right, right and right. something like, you know, the Red Letter Media, Mr. Plunkett videos, which went very viral. Very, very well received. And just 10 years of people doing stand-up routines about it, sure. Patton Oswalt's bit, all these things. I feel like everyone's sort of gotten this sense of like, okay, this is what Star Wars actually is. Mm-hmm. Those critics looked at it and they went, yeah, they're robots, they're aliens, ships Bleeps fly. And it's Star Wars. Bleeps and bloops. Right. And then, like, in the last 10 years, I feel like the people who cared about these movies were like, no, let's figure out what it is. And this is the first thing I can say. J.J. Abrams has successfully identified what it is that makes Star Wars Star Wars. I agree. But, I mean, I do think that's his strength Agreed. as a storyteller. Agreed. And, you know, I think that, like, it's it's not hard to say, like, have you seen his Star Trek, you know, yeah. his 2009 Star Trek? Uh, what he felt like he had done there, at least to me when I saw it, was he had identified the semiotic strengths right. of Star Wars yeah. and plugged this movie into them. Yeah. And this movie goes the exact same path yeah. of, like, you take in your character one, then they kind of bump into the next one, bump into, you know, all these sort of story coincidences on this kind of rolling train. Well. And, yeah. you know, it just sort of gathers steam and it's steeped in nostalgia. But, you know, it's doing enough new stuff that you're kind of overjoyed by it. But this is such a fucking Star Wars movie. Yeah. I feel like your mileage with this film will largely exist yeah. in relation to how you feel about Star Wars. Do you love Star Wars? You're probably going to love this movie. Yeah, it feels like a Star Wars movie. Do you not particularly care about Star Wars? You're probably not going to really care you're for it. You're probably going to think the movie's okay and kind of, you yeah. know, gets messy at the end. And, uh, you know, like, that. I feel like that's going to be your take. But what were my two biggest, like, wishes for this movie? I want it to be fun. It uh, definitely is. Very fun. In the next episode that's being released, our holiday special, which we recorded before this. Look forward to that one, guys. We each made predictions about what we thought were going to happen in the movie. And I, I'll say I nailed my predictions. I was 100% correct. Uh-huh. The second thing is I want to feel like a Star Wars movie. Yeah. I want to feel like I'm watching Star Wars and this makes me feel the way Star Wars does. Wild success in that category. Let's read the crawl because this is, I, oh. I would say, the best crawl. It's a good crawl. And it's like straight to the point, J.J. Abrams is like, I'm not fucking around with you. I'm not. Fucking talking about trade federation blockades. I'm not using like circular language that's hard to follow. Go on. Do you have the crawl? Of course. Let's read it. It's episode seven, The Force Awakens. Wait, just quick sidebar. Some people weren't sure if episode seven was going to be in the title because in the marketing materials, just Star Wars, The Force Awakens. Right. But this movie opens with fucking episode seven. Yeah. But I was always sure that it would. What I thought that Abrams was doing was what Lucas did, which is those movies originally were marketed as Star Wars. Yes. The Empire Strikes Back yes. and Return of the Jedi. And then when you went in, that was the subtitle. The episode yeah. thing only came around for Phantom Menace, and I yeah. think he only deployed it. And if you remember, the title, the poster title is of the Phantom Menace is like little font, Star Wars, big font, episode one. Tiny font, 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 Phantom, the Menace. Phantom Menace. Yeah. yeah. Which is fine. I think he was trying to be like, this is a prequel. You know, Me that too. was his thing. Yeah. Fine. Uh, so this is, you know, like almost everything else Abrams has done in this movie, he's taken it back to the original just with a r- 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 remix. It's like a great cover album, you know? Yeah. It's like listening to, like, Otis Redding. It's, I agree with that, except it's like a great cover album, except there's also a fucking awesome new saxophonist who's, oh, yeah. like, going to just, like, take over the world. Well, I'm saying and her listen, name is Daisy Ridley. You listen to Otis Redding live in Europe, right? Which is one of my favorite albums ever. I love Otis Redding. Yeah. And, like, he does respect. He does Aretha Franklin's respect. And he sure. completely reorchestrates it, changed the energy of it. You know, the song is wildly different being sung by a man rather than a woman. Yeah. Aretha Franklin's version is maybe still better because it has the newness and the discovery, you know? But, like, great fucking cover. He made it his own, and he changed it. He changed the text of it, you know? Not literally the lyrics. But, like, I, I feel like this is the same thing. He's very conscious about what he's keeping the same and what he's changing. And structurally, it's very, very similar to A New Hope. Okay, let's read The Crawl. The Crawl. Luke Skywalker has vanished. I mean, amazing. Bam. Because, like, everyone's been going, where's Luke? Why isn't he in the marketing materials? Not in the trailers, not in the posters. Right off the bat, they're telling us, like, here's what's good. Luke Skywalker has vanished. So cool. In his absence, the sinister First Order has risen from the ashes of the Empire and will not rest until Skywalker, the last Jedi, has been destroyed. Wait, so you're telling me that this movie isn't going to cover how slowly a forced order, first order comes together? That they're just going to tell us that it happened, and then just set the world in that movie? The movie in that world? Yeah. Yeah, that's great. With the support of the Republic, cool. 
General Leia Organa Ooh. leads a brave resistance. So cool. She is desperate to find her brother Luke and gain his help in restoring peace and justice to the galaxy. Okay. Love it. Emotional stakes. Cool. Sure. Fine. It's personal. Leia has sent her most daring pilot on a secret mission to Jakku, where an old ally has discovered a clue to Luke's whereabouts. Dot, dot, dot. It's a good crawl. Good crawl. I have no problem with the crawl. You're kind of high on the crawl. I loved it. I think that first line is great. Amazing. Um, I think that the First Order resistance thing is fine. It's a little confusing. I like that they just sum it up in one sense. It's like, out of the ashes, the First Order rose. And it's like, I, you know, I was uh, drinking with geeks last night. Mm-hmm. Uh, myself and talk about that. Self-identifying. And, uh, you know, we were weighing the things we I, did and didn't like about the movie. And yeah. they were like, I wish there was a little more explanation of the First more. Order. Could have done went. with a little more. Now, I was talking to my pal Spencer Kornhaber, who I adore, yeah. uh, who was not a huge fan of this movie. Yeah. Uh, my coworker. Mm-hmm. And that was one of his complaints was like, what is this, you know, what is this first order? What is this resistance like? And it seems like it was a problem with Matt Singers, too, another friend of okay. ours. Yeah. You know, I think that Abrams is so seems so focused on avoiding everything about the prequels that, you know, maybe mm-hmm. he could identify as a problem. And the obsession with politics, the obsession with like the machinations of this galaxy. Yeah. And just immediate spoiler. No, there's like Senate none. scenes in this entire movie. <laughs> none. <laughs> none zero um so you know so maybe that's one of the reasons that yes they but it is because like i have to sort of project a lot of my guesses onto it right so you've got this idea that like the empire is is you know decapitated in mm-hmm. return of the jedi but obviously it's many sort of functions and it's like you know it's military it all, it's all still out there like yeah. war must ensue, like just sort of like more of a drudgery, you know, type of, you know, like just sort of chipping away planet by planet. Agreed. As this re- republic, which is a, obviously somewhat of a fragile entity. And if you also created. like, okay, so let's say you dismantle the the empire, there's still going to be people, civilians who yeah. are followers. Yeah. Who are going to want to go like, well, I liked what they were up well, to. Well, also carry like, the torch. You're trying to govern a galaxy. Yeah. So, I mean... So this this first order, which seems to have a lot of resources, yeah, because they built a planet base. Huge. It's a planet, and there's this like great uh, scene where it's uh, General Hux, played by Donald Gleason, yeah. giving a big speech, sort of the leader, and it thing. looks like Triumph of the Will. Well, that's and it's the idea. Like hundreds and thousands of stormtroopers. I read somewhere Abrams was saying like the idea he thought of was like, what if like the Nazis in Argentina, like the sort of Nazi remnant, yeah. had just sort of survived and taken hold in a new organization? Okay. But they're pretty big, like you're saying, the resistance. Really big. And they built a planet. I mean, yeah. not the resistance. The, the first, first order. order. The yes, first order. yes, yes. And so here's the real question. Yeah. So we kind of get that, whatever. It's sort yeah. of the empire rebranded, right? right. And even, in an even more terrifying sort of way. Yes. Um, what the hell is the resistance? Because okay. they are the establishment. Uh, kind of. Like if the Republic is... You know, in existence, which it seems to be, according uh-huh. to this crawl. That's a good point, yeah. Then why are they called the Resistance, exactly? Why isn't this just the Republic Army? He's made this distinction for some reason, and there are vague references, very tossed-off references from Kylo Ren, mostly, Yeah, about, like, you know, they're liars, and the Resistance and the Republic are, t- you know, are one thing. And, like, I just could have done with... I'm sure you could have just tossed in a couple of junky sentences, just... Just a little more clarity. Well, okay, so this is a complicated issue, a thorny issue that I want to get into, okay? Yeah. J.J. Abrams is someone who studies the semiotics, figures out how it works, why it works, recreates it, right? Puts his own spin on it, adds a lot of new stuff, too. But that's really his skill as, you know, like a pop culture showman. Sure. Agreed. One of the things that is so effective about the original trilogy, and especially... A New Hope, mm-hmm. a.k.a. Star Wars, period. Right. Is that there is so much happening outside of the parameters of the movie, you know? Yeah. There's so much implied history to everything. So little is explained. You feel like you're just being dropped into the world. And you can tell the world is fully realized in his mind. 
And you can sort of infer what's going on just from how people behave with each other, just from how they speak about stuff. But they don't explain how structures happened. And in fact, when you go back and explain those things, a lot of times, it demystifies them, right? Yeah. Yes, as, of as done in the prequels. I know. Now, by all accounts, George Lucas originally like wrote this massive screenplay that he presented to Fox when he was pitching the original Star Wars in their mid-70s. Mm. And they were like, this is incomprehensible. It's huge. It would cost $5 billion. And he sort of pared it down and made like A New Hope what was essentially like the okay. second act of his story, uh -huh. right? Uh -huh. And so part of why there's so much bursting at the seams in that movie is he knew exactly what happened right before and right after. I don't think movie. that's true. I know. I think I don't think he knew exactly. I think like right before. I think he changed it after that. But I'm saying I have never. I I will say it. it this is a sidetrack, but like it has always been a little mysterious. What exactly Lucas had? I think he changed his plans. What is known is that the story that comprises A New Hope was originally a small part of that original screenplay. He wanted that script to span decades. Yeah, yeah, okay. I, know, I, know, I, know. I think he changed all of his plans on the fly. Yeah. But the point was, he built this world in a movie where he thought he'd be able to explain everything, resolve everything, and in fact realize, like, no, just do the middle section. That's the thing that people want to see. We don't need the explanation. We don't need everything ending, you know? Like, a tidy bow. We just need, like, the little story there. And so that sort of happened by accident because he did all this work that then he cut out, but it was still in there. You know, he had the thoughts. Yeah. J.J. Abrams is trying to replicate that same effect but I think he is doing that by purposefully withholding information. Do you know what I'm saying? Which is his want I kind to of buy argument, but I, I no, still No, I'm not just... saying this in a good way or a bad way. Yeah. I just think it's an interesting thing to look at because he's going, I want the same thing where there's so much implied and I so know. much that isn't explained, but he's not doing that by accident. He's going, let me write stuff. I'm sure he, if I you sat down it. with J.J. Abrams, he'd be able to explain it all to you. Mm. I like having less explained, but it also feels like at times he could give us a little more. Yeah, I, I just, yeah, I know what you mean, obviously, yeah. and the original movie doesn't explain much either, but, like, if you're talking about something that is referenced, it's all jumping off of things Agreed. we already know, but you've changed it in ways that don't totally make sense. Agreed. You could have just, whatever, doesn't matter. Agreed. Let's move on. I'm not, I'm not saying okay. it's We're good moving on. We're moving or on. bad. Yeah. I just think it's interesting. Now, the last night of the crawl sets up what's maybe my least favorite element of this entire movie. An old ally has discovered some, some, you know, a map to Skywalker. Biggest demerit against J.J. Abrams. Don't cast Max von Sydow in this part. What it's is It's incredibly this? distracting. He plays a character called, what's his name? It's like Tark Ball Foom, something like that. He's got like... <laughs> Lore Santeca. Lore Santeca. Yeah, Lore, not Lord, Lore Santeca. Lore Santeca. Uh, uh, Max von Sydow. One of the greatest actors of all time. Arguably one of the greatest actors who has ever been in movies yeah i mean one of the most incredible careers ever if you look at all the different things he spanned all the different people he's worked with you know how much I mean, he's 86 years old he's gone through so many different iterations of of what film is been there along the way as like this medium and this industry developed in different countries you know yeah love max love him what's he doing in this movie? to open the movie with him he has the first line. Oh, wait. Producer Ben just stuck his head back in. Checking the levels. Bye, Ben. Great. I love you, Ben. He has the first line in the movie. Uh, yeah, which is like, this should set things right or something like which that. Which is pretty meta. I know. Um, it is a little meta. And uh, he's, he's talking to Poe Dameron, played by Oscar Isaac. Played by Oscar Isaac, okay. our, the, who is, um, you know, the... Uh, the most daring pilot that yeah. Leia has been. Yeah. Um, but he, like, there's no character here. It's just like, here's an old man giving something to someone. Yeah. I mean, who the fuck? An old ally? Who the fuck is this guy? It's so distracting it's when it's Max von Sydow. You could have cast anybody in this All right, part. we're nitpicking, though. Anyway, he, right, because, like, let's not, you know. Yeah. But, I mean, yeah, you got Max von Sydow, who, like, obviously we've known was in the movie, you know, his, his, his he casting gets, has and been And Max von Sydow. <laughs> He was part of the original cast announcement along with the leads. And it's like, okay, great. There he is. He gets uh, this flash drive. Yeah, to, he hands a flash drive to Poe Dameron, 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 played by Oscar Isaac. I'll, my say, this, Honey Bunch. I'll yeah. say this. I think maybe the reason they cast Max von Sydow is pretty much the first beat in the movie is Kylo Ren, the, the movie's big villain, yeah. uh, killing him yes. while hunting for this info. And von Sydow just, just murders this, like, one minute, what, 
maybe not even like 40 second confrontation with him maybe even less maybe like, like 30 where yeah. he's basically like a mix of sort of scornful and like despairing about kylo ren who we obviously know nothing about but he also just sort of like gives up he's like i can't keep on you know yeah but i mean so maybe abrams just wanted someone who could really sell the shit out of that scene but you know what just get some random english guy that was the trick george lucas pulled right. over and over yeah. again and it usually worked a bunch of great stage actors you could get to play that part whatever so kylo ren you know it's more just annoying because you're like are we supposed to know who this is like is he, does he have some sort of analog in the original trilogy? Like No. But no, he doesn't. He's just Lor Santeca. No, and I was almost expecting that later in the film, other characters would like talk about him in ways that put him in a greater yeah, right, perspective. Right. And like they never did. He's yeah. just an old guy, yeah. hands a flash drive, it's Poe Dameron. Not a bad performance, but just distracting because you keep on going like, there has to be a reason they hired Max von Sydow to do this. And they it's never uh, revealed. No, nope, whatever. Whatever. Uh, Poe Dameron gets this flash drive and is immediately besieged by Kylo Ren. Mm -hmm. In this, they're on Jakku. Yeah. This deserty, Tatooine planet. Almost identical. Pretty much Tatooine. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I think wisely. Look, I mean, this is the remix I'm talking about. Right. It's like Abrams was like, "We need a desert planet. Can't be Tatooine. There's too much mojo with that one. Yeah. There's just like that's just there's a whammy on that one. Prequel whammy." Original movie whammy. We'll just we'll just revive it. It'll be a new you know type of. Mm -hmm. Also, Tatooine's supposed to be in the outer rim. Yes, and this is not. This is very much in the center of things, and was the site of some sort of great battle that happened a long time ago. Because there's like crashed starships everywhere. Yeah, and it feels shittier than Tatooine. Like it feels yeah, like it's even shittier than. It's Tatooine. even shittier, and there's like it's more. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, it's it's even more sparse. There's less civilization. It feels like there's less there's less life on it. You know, no huts, no huts. Um, the huts really made the trains run on time in Tatooine. You know, <laughs> yes, yes, I do know. Um, okay, so Kylo Ren comes in, comes in, troopers takes. They look great. Yeah, it looks cool. Captain Phasma, who's like his right hand. Um, I believe the first shot of the movie is those stormtroopers in the ship right and like the light kind of rattling well we do the classic star wars shot where like where the ship is overhead there's a yeah, moon yeah. and then the the it's ship, under us actually yes. yeah and you see how big the ship is and then it's stormtroopers rattling which is immediately an interesting start mm -hmm. and it's like lights flashing again like these little like you know seizure inducing glimpses mm -hmm. of like the stormtroopers in the wings waiting to and we're getting attack. a sense of the mental experience of one of our heroes finn right uh, but we don't really know that yet, right. but that is so what's happening. Cuts Alor Santeca, hands the flash drive almost immediately. They land. They land. They start fuck fucking shit up. up. And they're great, shooting Great people. moment, let's say. Poe Dameron shoots his gun. Well, I was about to say. Poe okay, Dameron yeah. shoots his gun from long range, like a sniper kind of yeah. ray gun. And Kylo Ren, this sort of Darth Vader type, this black Mac mask clad, you know, guy. Played just, by Adam Driver. Pl just flips around and stops the laser beam in time there's just like a laser just, beam in the it's air just frozen in the air cool it's pretty cool yeah and poe dameron you know gets like that's it he's yeah. you know he's captured but luckily he put his flash drive in a little ball droid called bb8 who zaps off in the other direction r2d2 style mirror number one the film starts with someone I swear to God, it's probably already mirror number four but yeah. yes but but big mirror yeah, plans in the droid. Character who's about to be taken, kidnapped. Taken, kidnapped. What am I talking I slept like three hours last night. Who's about to be taken hostage, puts his information in a droid, yeah. and now this droid is left to wander the desert alone. But and let's let's talk about Oscar Isaac in this movie. We gotta talk about all these characters. Yeah. Because he immediately is like giving Kylo Ren so much lip, yeah. as, as the English might say. He's just like totally... Ugh. This guy's fucking magic. He's one of the best he's a great actor. actors we have. He is. Yeah. Um, he's, like, incapable of having an uninteresting moment on screen. Mm -hmm. And this is an interesting part for him because when they announced that he was going to be in the film, I was like, well, obviously, Oscar Isaac's got a hard edge. He usually plays these people who are fucking angry at the world, you he know, does. have a chip on their shoulder. He's like Lewin Davis, uh, Most Violent Year. Yeah. In Show Me a Hero on HBO this year. Yeah. Yeah. Even Ex Machina is like this guy who doesn't trust anyone. He's Machina. great in everything. Great performance. Um, but I thought, okay, he's going to be the Han Solo analog. He's going to be the yeah, character. Yeah, no, we all thought, like, because he's playing a pilot, we all just thought he would be the slightly more cynical, 
What's sort this of fucking edge. Star Wars bullshit? You know, thing? you've got your your two like kind of more moon eyed leads. Yes, uh, John Boyega, Daisy Ridley, oh, and then Oscar yeah. Isaac's in there to be kind of no. He is the most earnest, yeah. lovable. Aw shucks. I love flying a ship. Yeah. Fuck you, bad guys. Right, like kind he gives lip to the bad guys, but that's because he hates bad guys. He's a he good guy. He doesn't like bad guys. He's like the least conflicted good guy I've ever seen. He likes to fly his ship around and shoot bad guys. Yeah. He's the best pilot in bang, the goddamn bang, bang. galaxy. But Oscar Isaac's such a good actor that it doesn't feel like, oh man, what a like lame, like one dimensional Boy Scout character. It's like, no. oh, this is a real portrayal of a guy who just loves being good. Yeah. Yeah, he has no exact analog to the original movies, I would say. He's probably the least um, connected to the original movies yeah. in that way. Yeah. Because everyone else in the original movies is not really part of the rebel framework to begin with. You know, they're kinda, they kind of get sucked into it one by one. Luke, Han, Lando. I, I feel like our, Leia kind of is, but she's yes. sort of her own thing. I feel like our three main leads from, from the, the 70s movies, the Leia, Han, and Luke, it's like they put them all in one pot together. And then stirred them up, and then distributed all those pieces amongst our three new leads. Yeah, I, there's no the leads do not have exact analogs. They have a mix map. Mishmash. Most of yeah. this movie has pretty solid analogs to the original movie. Story wise, a hundred. Not so much with these lead characters. Who, yeah. yeah, just have a little bit of everything. Yeah, Oscar Isaac's great. He's not in this movie a ton. No, I'm hoping they use him more in the future films. Every time he's on screen, that. I was rock hard. He's great. Um, but you know, he's there to 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 as our entry character. Yeah. He gets captured by Kylo Ren. Yeah. He gets taken up. Jakku is getting just massive. These people are getting massacred. Well, and Kylo Ren. Kylo Ren is after Luke yeah. Skywalker, yeah. which this, these, you know, these plans supposedly would lead him to him. And Kylo Ren kills, learns Senteca, and then he's like, troops. Kill them all. Kill them all. So as they're all getting taken away, one of the troops can't do it. He can't shoot people. They're like lined up all these civilians. You see humans, you see aliens, and they all look sad, defenseless children. Yeah, of course. Very sad. They all get murdered by these stormtroopers, but one guy just can't pull his... Pull the trick. And he's focusing on the stormtrooper, but you don't see his face. Like, you know, it's like, this is this guy looks as masked and anonymous as anyone else. And he also, one of the stormtroopers gets shot, I guess, by uh, Poe, yes. I think. And, like, puts a bloody paw print, a uh, handprint, you know, on this stormtrooper. Which is great visual helmet. storytelling. Yeah, so while nice. he has the helmet on, you can tell which one he is. Anyway, and so already Kylo Ren and this guy's commanding officer, Phasma, who's this, yeah. like, Chrome stormtrooper, they notice, like, something's up with this kid. Like, He's not pulling his... Pull gun. the trigger. But they're also like, look, we'll deal with that. Later. Yeah. You know, this is clearly a well-oiled machine that has no patience for whatever's going on, any kind of individuality. Right. But they're also like, eh, it's a kink, we'll smooth it out. So they get back on the ship, and they go back to their base, and then you see this stormtrooper with the bloody helmet Take his helmet off. Right. It's Ray. It's Finn. Finn. Sorry, Finn. John Boyega. Which we knew. I mean, if you've seen any trailer, right. you know. He's the stormtrooper. He, you know, we get a very brief idea of these stormtroopers rather than being like a clone base. Yeah. And this is even mentioned. It's the one prequel thing that gets mentioned. Yeah. Is Hux and Ren are arguing about like their, the stormtroopers. Yeah. And, you know, they say, like, well, clones, you know, we want clones? Yeah. These are, like, brainwashed. They're, like, taken from families at baby age. They're, like, child soldiers. And brainwashed. Yes, they're, like, child soldiers. It's, like, it's not Netflix's they brainwashed. mediocre it's like movie. They were raised within. Uh, Beasts of No Nation. I haven't seen it. It's all right. It's pretty good. They were raised within this environment. They know nothing else. And this is, I, I think, one of the places where J.J. Abrams, like, really successfully identifies what makes Star Wars Star Wars. This is a guy who's known nothing else in his life. Right. He explains later he was taken as an infant, was trained for this. But this was his first mission. There's a funny twist where they say later in the film that he worked in sanitation. Right. This was his first mission, and something just clicks in him. Right. It's not going to work. It's almost it's like he has left... a moment where he's like, am I the bad guy in this movie? And just doesn't want to kill people. And it's left ambiguous if it's just he's just one in a million and it just didn't work out. Yeah. Or if there is some sort of larger force-related incident. We don't know. We don't know. We don't know, but he takes off the helmet, and John Boyega, a phenomenal actor, conveys so much in the first look that yeah, he gets. He's, he's sweating. And he's scared, and he's a little boy. He, he's like, sweating. doesn't know what he's doing. What I like about Boyega's performance in this is it's a real performance. Yes. Um, he leaves the movie star performances to Ridley, Daisy Ridley, and Oscar Isaac. Yeah. And, you know, Harrison Ford. Right. And... He God, we have this, so much to talk about. in this whole movie yeah. is so discombobulated and yeah. doesn't let go of that, and like doesn't let go of the fact that this guy is almost trying to keep up and be cool. Well, as yes. everyone around him is so cool. This is what I would say. Everyone else is giving a movie star performance, and John Boyega is giving a character actor performance of a guy pretending to be a movie star. I mean, 
his character is someone who wants everyone else to think that he's like the cool hero of the movie. He's kind of like the teen sidekick. Yeah. Who is like, you know, could be the hero one day. Yeah. But right now is just kind of like looking at everyone else and being like, okay, all right, okay, you're doing that, okay. Well, okay. we're skipping ahead a little bit, but like, mm-hmm. there's a, there's an exchange that happens later between Finn and Han Solo where I kind of realize like. Oh, this is who Han Solo was when he was 23. Like, when we meet Han Solo in A New Hope, he's, like, 34. Yeah, right. He's he's already been around the block. And this is, like, Finn in, like, the fake it till you make it stage. Right. Where, like, Han Solo already successfully doesn't give a shit when we meet him. And, like, Han seems Han to Solo recognize that. at this that. point now, what I like, because yeah. in, in A New Hope, he's all, he's, like, all bluster. He's yeah. the cock of the walk. He's trying to be impressive. Right. The minute Obi-Wan leaves the bar table, he's like, Jesus Christ, thank God they're hiring yeah. us. In this movie, when they're presented with, like, a stressful situation, he's like, I don't know, I'll do my usual bullshit. It usually works out. So you go, like, it's three stages in the evolution of a type of person, right? Finn is the guy who knows how he wants people to see him but doesn't know how to pull it off yet. Han Solo is the guy who's able to pull it off successfully even though it's an act. Yeah. And old Han Solo is the guy who's dropped the act and is finally just ready to be real. Um, Finn takes off the helmet. Immediately Captain Phasma is like, who told you to fucking take your helmet off? I know. Put your helmet back. Gwendolyn Christie plays Captain Phasma. Pretty small role, but you know cool. what? Great voice. Really cool. Yeah. Great voice. Amazing character design. This armor looks unbelievable. She's got a little side cape, a little shoulder cape, chrome armor. Um, but it also feels like like a metatextual thing of like, stormtroopers aren't supposed to be characters. Put your helmet back. I know. I actually like that. Me too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Loved That's it. a good call. You know? That's a good call. The whole idea is that it, they're anonymous force. And we don't we humanize never see- them. In any of the original movies, a stormtrooper takes his helmet off, except for Han and Luke when they're pretending, but that doesn't quite count. Yeah. And it does seem wrong. It's like, whoa, no, no, no. No one's supposed to know that there's a person under there. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, you are the sort of fist of the, uh, of well, at this point, the First Order. Like, you're, you're just fodder. You're cannon fodder. And there's, like, a real humanist point to this, too, which is, like, you can't argue that everyone who fights on the wrong side of a war is in and of themselves evil. No, I mean, there are these moral quandaries that people pose about the original trilogy, which is like, you know, they blew up the Death Star. There's, you know, what about the poor, like, garbage men they on the Death Star or whatever? Yeah. You know, like, do you, how, 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 you know, how much can blame be transferred among yeah. the employees of the Empire? And but like, you know what? That's war. Yes, right. And I'm a Jew who's eternally terrified of there being another Holocaust. But, like, it is naive to think that you know, if you just grow up in Germany and that's the guy who's in charge and he's enlisting people for the army, I- I'm sure a lot of people had their fin moments where they were like, oh, fuck, what the fuck am I doing? But it's also like a lot of people get caught up in a world where they just don't have perspective. Yeah, you know, they don't sure. know that there but is I mean, wrong. Uh, uh, I'm yes. not supporting Nazis. No, no, I know you're not, but yeah. let's let's stay away from that anyway. But you get but, what I'm saying. Well, but more, but like, to be fair, this movie doesn't even doesn't even dip into that moral territory so much because it's like, no, he was brainwashed. You know, like, they, they make it very clear. Well, same with the Hitler youth. I mean, that's a greater analogy. Or child soldiers is what we're saying. My point we're, is, yeah, okay. my point is, they're going, here is a faceless mass that we have seen throughout these other yes. movies. His only name is FN2187. He never had a name. They gave him a, a name. code name. Yeah. Okay, so he, something just clicks he, in him. Something clicks with him. He immediately, Abrams is like, go, let's go, go, yeah. go. He Moving immediately, really yeah, fast. Let's, you know, he, uh, Poe gets free. or No, he frees Poe. Poe is, you know, Kylo rents to, you know, Interrogates him, tries to get the information matter. out of him, can't do it. Reports no, back. No, no, he gets the information out of him. Oh, yes. It's right, just yeah. the information is just, it's in a droid. Right. Yeah. yeah it's and, that I gave the information to someone else. You can't have it. Yeah. And, uh, and so Finn frees him and says, like, can you, you know, I'm having this moment of crisis. Can we get out of here? And Poe immediately is like, you just need a pilot. But okay, I'm your pilot. So good, yeah. They get in the TIE fighter. They get the fuck out of there. Go right. back to Jakku. Right. Fit. Which Finn is like, whoa, no, 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 no. He, this is a funny beat in this movie over and over again is that everyone Finn meets wants to go back to Jakku, the site of his, like, it's trauma. Fuck Jakku. And he's like, can we go anywhere else? We have yeah. spaceships. Even, even if I didn't have the worst moment of my life take place on that planet, it's also just objectively Not an interesting planet. a shitty place but, you know, to be. Poe needs to go get BB-8. Yeah. yeah. They get in this TIE fighter. The TIE fighter crashes, and they are separated. Poe is basically out of the movie for the next hour. I just want to uh, step back for a second and just discuss uh, yeah, yeah. The, layers, on, buddy. the layers of the moment where... where Finn is the you need a pilot thing. Yeah, that's with great. With Poe. It's like moment. immediately Finn like comes in and he's like He's I'm sweaty. You. He's Come sweaty, scary, this Finn. and that. And Poe immediately sees through it and is like, You're trying to get your own ass saved. 
You want a pilot? That's fine. I'll help you. Just be honest with me. Don't fucking pretend that you're Here's like, what I like. The yeah. moment where Finn is like, Finn is obviously like, oh, God, I don't know what to do. Yeah. I'll get this guy out of here. Maybe that'll work. And he's like, can you fly a TIE fighter? Like, really nervous. Yeah. And Poe just goes, I can fly anything. Plan. And Finn, John Boyega, flashes this, like, delighted grin. Movie star smile. Where he's just like, oh, God, all right, this is going to work out. This movie's going to work out. My world is going to be cool now. I'm going to have a cool life. Um, and, and also let's say you were just smiling. I'm so happy. Yeah. And uh, Poe is the one who names Finn. He's like, what's your name? Yeah. What's your name? He's FN 2187. Right. And he's like, okay, let's just call you Finn. Cause you should have a real fucking person name. Crashes. He wakes up in the middle of the desert. Doesn't see. Everyone in this movie has like a one syllable name. Finn, Poe, Ray, Cox. Like, you know, one, 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 Ren. Yeah. Um, crashes. Doesn't see Poe anywhere. Sees his jacket as the typhoon gets sucked into like a sand pit. Which is another classic Star Wars touch of just, like, things could go wrong anywhere. This is quicksand, the creature's everywhere, like, shit's just happening, right? So, Finn takes off his Stormtrooper armor, puts on the Resistance jacket, and walks for miles and miles and miles and miles across empty desert until he gets to, like, what seems to be a little village in Jakku. Yes. Now, let's pull back away from this because... Um, gotta talk about Rey. Gotta talk about Rey. The hero of this movie. The lead. The yeah, lead the character lead in the movie. film, the hero of now, this film. I'll say they really tricked us, Yep, which is good. I like being tricked in this way, not in the way that Abrams tricked us on Star Trek Into Darkness, where the trick, we yeah. could tell the trick, trick from the beginning. Yeah, um, Like, we could tell the trick of Star Trek Into Darkness before uh, the script was written. Yes. We were like, they're going to do con. They're, they're lazy. They're going to do con. That's the second movie. You could tell that was the twist after Star Trek did well the first yeah, weekend. Yeah, exactly. The box office returns. You're like, next time con. Right, right. Everyone. And then they're like, we've cast Benedict Cumberbatch as John Tim- Harrison. Johnny Smithman. Fuck you. We've cast him as Whiteman Nobody. Yeah. <laughs> it's the, anyway, I hate that Well, movie. and they also did like fucking Benicio Del Toro was originally in Talks to Play Con. And then when he dropped out, the short list was like, Four other actors of Hispanic or Latino yeah, descent. Right, 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 right. And then they were like, oh, you thought it was calm, but look, we cast a white guy. And, and everyone's like, like, congrats on casting a white guy. Wow. <laughs> just, good, good job. You, you whitewashed 30 Khan. years later, yeah, you, you managed. I mean, fucking cons in like the 60s Star Trek, they managed yeah. to cast a Latino actor. Now it's like, ah, yeah, but have you ever seen a white English actor yeah. as a villain? Whoa. Just, just to throw us off your scent? J.J. Abrams has been appropriately contrite about Star Trek Into Darkness, but yeah. I just want to say, fuck Star Trek Into Agreed. Darkness. It's his worst Dumb film. Movie. He'll no likely question. never tank a film that badly. I agree. Uh, so, Ray. And he wrote regarding Henry. Let's, he wrote Armageddon. Let's talk about Ray. Let's Bay, talk about Bay. Ray. Sorry. Sorry that I got on that track. Anyway, you know, in all the advertising, I was just like, oh, Boyega, Finn, this guy yeah. is this guy's the this lead. The guy. And Ray's going to be the co-lead who's sort of the tinkerer, the pilot, you know. Yeah this sort of foil it's her movie it's her movie full stop start to finish yeah front and back she's your luke yeah but she's kind of your han and she's kind of your leia she's kind of she's all got three it all baby package. she's one of the most fully rounded characters we've ever seen in a star wars movie. you know i saw someone i forget who wrote this so carry on talk about ray for a second well we first see her and she's like like scourging around mm-hmm. she's like she's yeah. like a junk Lady. She's like, well, she lives on Jakku, and it yeah. seems like life on Jakku sucks and is defined by the fact that this like monumental battle happened decades yeah. ago. So there are these l- crashed ships, right? She's scavenging in a star destroyer, pulling yeah. little bits out of like a basically hollow star destroyer, right? She lives in a AT 18, like in a oh, destroyed so cool. AT 18, yeah. And she goes down to the market every day and like you know, trades in these bits. For like a measly like ration of food from this sort of CGI merchant character played, played by, by Simon, Simon Pegg. Pegg. Yeah, not my favorite aspect of the movie. Although Pegg's voice is fine, I liked it. Yeah, some of these creatures, I was just like, man, why are you doing CGI here? Like, double down. Well, no, I'll tell you what that creature was. That was a fully practical suit with like with a, a CGI face. Like it was CGI a fixed face on set, movements. and they did the express. I mean, it was like uh, the where the wild things are. Thing. Guess what, buddy? What? No, I no. liked it. No, I liked it. Um, little detail that I loved. He like she gives him all the junk she's pulled together, and he's like, "Okay, that's worth half a ration." And he gives her like a packet of powder, and she goes home, turns puts the powder bread. in a plate, pours water on, turns into bread, know, and it's like cool. that's a crazy future thing. I know, but the, in this the bread planet, was very cool. In this planet, that's the worst food you could possibly I know, eat. I know, I know. Like it's so shitty. It's like green. 
But we're like, what? Instant bread. I know, I know. It's okay, cool. so she eats it in the AT, AT, whatever. And she's like wandering around the desert and she sees a guy on like a crazy beast with a net trying to capture a little thing. And who is it? It's our main BB-8. guy, BB-8. So she links up with this guy. She rescues him. She has her first hero moment early on where the merchant offers her 60 rations yeah. for BB-8. Knowing, I think, that this is like a wanted droid. They put out like APB, yeah. And she's like, ah, no, don't, I'm sorry. Don't worry about it's it. Like 60 rations, really appetizing. And once again, like Finn, she makes the human decision. Right. Like it's implied that Abrams even, is doing some nice myth making here. But even when she sees them trying to capture BB-8, it's like she seems to have an empathy for droids that other characters in the movie do not. Like she seems to recognize that droids have like feelings. Yeah. You know? And we should say BB-8 is the most incredible creation. It's so cool. As much as he has been leaned on as like the toy of the movie, the kind yeah. of like international star of the movie that everybody's going to love, he rocks. He's real. Yeah. He moves with this sort of like real kind of sense of like, you know, the way his head moves. Oh, it's so it's very human. They get a lot of character out of him. And He's even got like, a cool sort of different kind of voice. Yeah. Like, you know, robot squeaky bloopy bloop voice. Done by, quote unquote, consultants, Hater Bill Hader and, and Ben Schwartz. Um, but he has like little gadgets pop out, but it never goes into R2. Never crazy. He's got a little Inspector shocker. Gadgets, he's got a little blowtorch. It's There's nothing much. a great moment where, where he, Finn gives him a thumbs up and then BB-8 shoots out his blowtorch to approximate a thumbs up. Great. Very good. Best he's moment got in the history little, of cinema. He's got these little like sort of wires that he can shoot out to kind of climb stuff. Yeah. He's Pretty great. cool. He's a great guy. Um, he's great. Love him. Love him. His scenes with Ray are great. Great. They have a great chemistry. Um. So, Ray... Uh, What's I gonna say about the BB-8? Ray captures BB-8, gets the rations, turns it down. Uh, these are two characters who, when faced with a decision where they could have selfish gain, choose to do the more human thing. Their morality is strong. Um, she doesn't sell BB-8. She's there. These people are sort of asking, you know, like he goes like, "Find the droid, get it, no matter what." Yeah. Okay. So Finn has now come into Jakku. Our two heroes are in the same area. That is. The sort of happenstance plotting that we've talked about, right? Yeah, the definitely. coincidency, Toy Story, original trilogy thing. And I was trying to isolate while watching this. Like, why does it work here? But in the prequels, everyone shows up at the right place at the right time and it feels forced. And here's the massive difference, mm-hmm. okay? And I think J.J. Abrams identified this so well. In the prequels, they get in a ship, they land, it happens to be at the door, they go in there, there's an enemy right there, they fight them. <laughs> Right? Yeah, sure. It's like he's just moving pieces along a board game because he's rolled that number on the die. Uh, yeah, yeah. And in the original trilogy, there's a lot of coincidence, right? That there two people is. have to be at the same place. But here's the big difference, and this movie gets it right. There's luck and happenstance that gets the character to that point where they're in that place, but then once they're in that position, they make an active choice that defines them as a character. Okay, go ahead. So Finn is here because that's where he happened to land. He's on the desert. He's wandering around. He stops at this place because there's a watering hole. He is dehydrated. Right. So he starts souping water yeah, up with his hands. He... There's this big boar creature there, right? Yeah. Meanwhile, a bunch of thugs are trying to yeah. attack Ray First order of thugs. and take yeah. BB-8, right? Yeah. Finn has his back to this. He's just drinking water. Right. But he's Turns. drinking so much of it that this boar creature gets annoyed and, like, shoulders him. Mm-hmm. And when he's shouldered, He's now realigned, so he's looking straight on at Ray. Okay. Now, it's a coincidence that he was there. It's a coincidence that the boar hit him at that moment. Yeah. But what defines him is that he goes, I need to help that woman. Yeah. Well, but then what I love, and I think what everyone's going to love. She's like, don't fucking is, help me. Well, he tries to help her. She's already taken care of it. Yeah. He grabs her arm and says, we got to go, because suddenly TIE fighters arrive, and it looks like the Empire's, you know, the First Order's about to rout this. Th- and she's like... Yeah, you don't need to hold my hand. I know how to run. He keeps on holding her hand, like, which is she, so fine. It's, and she keeps being like, dude, like, I don't need you to hold the hand. Like, I can run. You kind of need two hands to run. I think he also just has a crush on her. Of and course he does. doesn't? She's the greatest. I would like to say this right now. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. I, I'd love to take already. Daisy Ridley out for dinner. Yeah, I'd love to take John Boyega out for dinner. Let's do a double date. John Boyega, Daisy Ridley, if you're listening, I am single. David is not. We're both heterosexual. If you want to go out on a date, well, two of us will take you out. Um, I, I had a non-speaking role in a national commercial that ran for one month this year. I could probably pick up the check. Yeah. Does that pay a lot? Yeah. Because, you know, it's you always right. hear, yeah. like, 
some people like, wow, you know, this guy who's in this ad campaign, yeah, like he's set for life. And then other people like, eh, ads don't actually pay as well as you think they do. But national does, right? National is yes. what you need. I think I got paid a stupid amount of money in relation. Considering the work you did, sure. Yes. I, I literally was one of eight faces on screen trying to take a selfie with no dialogue for half a second and a 30 second ad. I played a lot for a month and then it was out of date because cell phone technology changes every two days. Um, but my point is, I've stowed that away for a special day in a sock under my bed. Daisy Ridley, if you want to go out for dinner, I'll pay for it with my Samsung mm. money. Cool. Um, like a pretty nice place. Not like a really, don't push my budget. But I, I'll like, there's a noodle shop in my neighborhood that's good. And I'll. We got to move on because uh, I don't even know how long we've done, but holy shit. This episode's going to be five hours long. Daisy Ridley, uh, it doesn't need any help. Um, maybe the best joke of the movie. I'm checking the time. Maybe the best joke of the entire movie. They're running away. There are explosions happening behind them. Uh, they're now looking for BB-8. They're looking for Finn. The First Order is coming in. You know, the TIE fighters are, are swinging down. And they're, like, running. And they're like, we need a ship. And she's like, there's a quad jumper right there. We can get to it. And they're, like, screaming at each other while they're, like, running towards it. And he's like, what about that ship? And she's like, that's garbage. We're not using that. Quad jumper. Quad jumper. Quad jumper. And then they get to the quad jumper and immediately blows up. And she goes... He goes, I guess we're going to have to use the garbage. No, 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 no. I think she doesn't, he doesn't say anything. She just says, garbage is fine. Garbage is fine. Garbage it is then, I think she says. I think, uh, well, it doesn't matter. Whatever. Wait. Who cares? Great movie. Camera pans over. What it, is it? It's the Millennium Falcon. You see, I actually, I'm so stupid that I didn't see that I didn't either. Immediately. I, I did mean, not it happens see it. quickly enough that you don't even really think about it. Yeah. But it's, and the whole audience, that was the first moment where the audience just burst into applause. And it was, like, involuntary. It wasn't even, like, yeah. showing what approval. It was, like, because you're gasping. You're just like, oh, my God, how well done. Um, I think I just turned to you and said, nice work. Yeah. Like, I went, like, good job. Yeah, that was great. Yeah. And they, and they run into this, and here it is, the Millennium Falcon. And if you thought it looked like set. trash before, it's, like, so beaten down It's now. real beat up. Barely works. She's never flown it before. He's never worked it's the like, gun around It belongs like this to the ration guy. It belongs to the merchant. He's just going to use it for junk. And they get in, she gets in the cockpit, he gets in the gunner, and they just have this dogfight with the TIE fighters, trying to get away from them and get off of Jakku. And she can't sort of make the ship work, she can't get the hyperdrive to work. Um, I'm going to get into another gripe territory. I don't think the action scenes in this movie are very well done. I think the action's a little flat. I agree. I think that this scene where the Falcon is being chased by the TIE the fighters best one. is the best one. Yeah. And it's because it has... Kind of the same energy of that first scene where Luke is in the uh, the gunner seat, mm -hmm. where it's like Finn is almost just delighted to be even shooting close to these guys. But also, neither of them know what they're doing. They've never sat in those chairs before. And so there's like a tension from them figuring it out as they go along. I think all the action beats in this movie are very well written. They have really good story beats in them, you know? They're not just like shit happening. There's like character moves happening within the beats, and they build and they have, like, catharsis and all of that. I just think, and I don't know if it was Disney being scared, if it was him not trusting himself, because I think the action in the original Star Trek's a lot cleaner, but there's a lot of fucking editing. He edits a lot. I do think the action in Star Trek is cleaner, but it's also Star Trek action, which is these sort of, like, big boat-like ships. Right. You know, so and there's it, like, only, moves like, a little slower. two ships at any given time. Yeah, yeah. Usually. So that helps. Yeah, he, it's fine. I would... It's not bad. It's kind of interesting. I also wonder if, again, he's trying to pull back from everything the prequels did wrong. One thing the prequels did was have a lot of very busy action. Not quick cut action, yeah. but just, you know, an overloaded frame with everything you can think of. Right. You know, what's this? The Falcon being chased by two fight TIE fighters. Yeah. One, two. And we see both TIE fighters get destroyed. Well, here's my And, thing. like, it's the same with the lightsaber fight yes. later where it's, like, there's no flubber. Yeah. It's, it reminded me, we'll talk about it in a bit, but it reminded me most of the Obi-Wan Darth Vader fight, which yep. is almost like a kendo fight where they're just kind of putting as it's much back fighting. into it. Yeah. Well, they're just sort of, ugh, you know, hacking away at each it's other. It's not crazy aerobics. It's sword fighting. Mm -hmm. um, I think the prequel films, he does too much busyness, but it's shot in a very classical way. Yeah. I think this film is classical action sequences shot in too busy a way. Yeah, I agree. What I I, want the is, action is the flattest part of the I movie. I want the middle ground, which is the original Star Wars movies. I zoned out slightly during the Maskatana action sequence that that 
they get a little hard to follow because he's cutting around so much. There's so much coverage. They're just, it, they lack the big sweeping moment that you want. You don't get those clean, iconic images. You don't hold on them. You're not seeing motion within the frame. The motion is established through camera moves and cutting. And it's very hard to maintain a sense of spatial geography when that's happening. It's yeah. them a little hard to follow. You can keep the emotional narrative because the characters are speaking throughout that. You understand what they're going through. The stakes are very clear. It does do that thing we love where it's like every five minutes in the movie, there's a clear objective. Yeah. You know what the characters need to get done. You understand emotionally what it means to them. Characters in this movie are so fucking good. This yeah. is the level, just to harp on this, that he hits it so far out of the park is like our new characters are great performances. Oh, yeah, that's what I was calling up. I forgot about this. Uh, Dan Coyce, I think his name is, I, can't, I don't know how you say his last name, K-O-I-S. Oh, yeah. We follow yeah, each yeah. other on Twitter. Yes. We're good friends on Twitter. Slate, writer, great, great guy. Love yeah. him. Wrote an article saying this is the first Star Wars movie without a single bad performance. Agreed. He's not wrong. <sighs> There's one, we'll do a quick performance review. Oh, wait, who don't you like? There's one I think is okay. Okay, we'll, we'll do a performance review. Cause I oh, th- I liked her. I know, and there's one that you said you weren't crazy about. We'll talk about it at the end mm-hmm. of the episode. Okay, okay. I think we both had one that we had reservations But nonetheless, about. like everyone's doing a good yeah, job, a lot yeah. of pros. Yeah, and the characters are all really well written. Above all, right. all else, they are We've human. We've been going for an hour, and we haven't even mentioned Han Solo's arrival yet. It's crazy. But I will say the first act of this film yeah. is the best act of the film. Yes. It is the most... It's like most of the myth-making and storytelling mm-hmm. and table setting is happening here, and it's the slowest part of the movie and the least plot, you know, uh, centric, you know, least, you know, least Star yes. Wars-y, you know. It's just we, stuff. It's characters doing stuff. We left out one oh boy, part. No, out no, because this is loud. important. I guess it's established for a little- fucking crying out it's fucking loud. Out. This is the f- podcast awakens. People no, no, are no, waiting no, for this. Wait, we got to go long. Go ahead. Go ahead. What, what is it? Um, I don't know how well, how directly it's highlighted here, how much more it comes into play later. But the the key to Rey as a character is her family left her on Jakku. Yeah. In this ATAT, she's like marking off the days, how many days she's been alone. And she just will not leave Jakku because she believes they're going to come back for her someday. Right. And so when she gets caught off in this adventure, she's immediately kind of like, I shouldn't be away from this long. What if my parents come back right now? She doesn't even ever say parents. Or maybe she says family. it once. She says family. family. But, like, yeah, we just know she, she's like that kid who, like, has been telling herself a lie so long it's yes. become true. Where it's like, ah, my parents are coming back, though. So, well, you know, is- she's like the kid in the foster home or yes. the group home who's like, but my yeah, parents you're all orphans, but back. my yeah. parents, they orphan. just went on a mission and They're they have to return. Yeah. yeah. Um, And this is the thing I like. We said this last night, but, like, I don't really count Anakin because he's, you know, in Phantom Menace, uh, not the main character. Mm. This is the first Star Wars movie where when I was seeing it for the first time, the heroes are younger than I am. Yeah. And I like that the two heroes, main heroes in this film, Finn and Rey, are self-sufficient. They've had to learn how to become adults in weird circumstances, but they also are very childlike in certain ways. And so, like, Finn has been, like, trained this and that, but he's also just, like, kind of a scared little boy who wants everyone to think that he's, like, a grown-up. And Ray is like actually self sufficient, fucking does it all on her own, but still is like, but my mommy's going back, right? So they're on the. I agree with you. So yeah. they're on the Millennium Falcon. Yes. Uh, quickly, things start to go wrong. Yeah. They get tractor beamed into a big sort of like freight ship. Right. And here's what I like about this scene. Yeah. Apart from that, it introduces Han Solo and Chewbacca, yeah. who are good Spoiler. characters. Spoiler. That I like. Spoiler alert. Uh, is that Ray and Finn are like, I know what we'll do. We'll put this doohickey in the engine, and that'll flood it with poison. Yeah, because they think it's a storm. We'll hide under the grate. It's yeah, gonna yeah, be yeah. space They're pirates trying to They're doing all this us. business. Yeah. Han and Chewie come in, and briefly are like, "Oh Jesus, are they gonna like flood this room with poison gas?" And like, yeah. they were gonna have to deal with all that. Yeah, you know. And Han and Chewie come in. They have their moment. We're home. It was from the trailer, yeah. you know, and. And immediately they're like, "Hey, what are you doing?" Yeah, <laughs> you know, they just lift up the grate. And they're I'm like, "Who are you, kids? You can't trick me." <laughs> yeah. uh, needs to be said, just right off the bat. Uh, Harrison Ford is great in this movie. This is his best work in years. Agreed. He's so awake and alive. Although I will say, I didn't see The Age of Adeline, and I heard some people liked him in that. Yeah, and I defend Morning Glory. Um, but but he's yeah. But Morning Glory is is an excuse for him to give a lazy performance. Agreed. Like because his character is supposed to be giving a Someone lazy doesn't performance. Give a shit anymore. So it's sort of a weird workaround. You like movies tell. like Cowboys and Aliens, yeah, and others recently that we have like, suffered uh, through, like Ender's Game, yeah, or I don't know what's another one. Uh, you know, even even Crystal Skull, the heartbreaking to watch. He just seems a little detached, and he's like in it. 
he's having a blast in this movie. Abrams is a good actress director. Great actor. He always has been. Yeah. Uh, he's one of the best finders of talent in Hollywood. He's also really good at juggling an ensemble. He's he good at but developing like, each we're, character. We're talking well. about the guy who found Jennifer Garner. Yep. You know, who found half that lost cast. Yep. Uh, you know, he's, he, uh, Carrie, uh, Carrie, Carrie Russell, Russell, I was going to say, yeah. You know, Greg Grumberg, just kidding. But, uh, you know, who is in this movie, infuriatingly. Yeah. There are, like, every time Abrams dropped a reference to his annoying, like, and I love J.J. Abrams, but his annoying, like, canon of shit, like, yeah. there's a Kelvin Ridge reference in there. Uh, yeah. I was like, J.J., back off. This is Star Wars. This is no slusho shit, at least. No slusho. No red ball. Yeah. Um, so, Hansel immediately sees through it. Yeah. And is just like, you know, what, what are you guys doing? I'm fucking Han Solo. And they're like, I am Han Solo. They're like, you're Han Solo? Yeah, they're like, you're the, the, the rebel general. Like, that's who you are? And then Ray's like, no, you idiot. The smuggler. The right, famous right, smuggler. Right. Yeah, that's I love. They, they both have different reference points for him. Because he was probably trained to, like, know Han Solo as an enemy. Yeah, rebel. Rebel. Bad rebel man. Right. Yeah. And she's, like, hearing just like. He's like the badass. He did the Kessel Run in 14 parsecs. And he's, and he's like, like 12. 12. God damn it. Yeah, which is great. But she's like hearing like the street level talk about like who Han Solo is. Yeah. And immediately you can tell he kind of likes these two kids. It's true. It's true. And they're like, so you did all this? That Luke Skywalker, all of this? And he's like, all right. Well, because they tell him that BB-8 has the map to Luke Skywalker. And they, and so we just get just a little bit yeah. of Han Solo's melancholy where he's like, yeah, I knew Luke. Yeah. I mean, he, he's not even upset about it. He's just like, yeah, yeah. It's all true. All that yeah, shit was all real. All that stuff. I used to think it was bullshit, but it's true. Just then, like, knock, knock, knock. Rap a tap tap at the door. Who is it? Space Pirates. Uh, this is, I would say, the worst part of the film. Agreed. Not terrible, but not good. Not good. Some people were comparing it to, like, it, saying it's the most prequely part of the movie. Sure. Um, I think it's but, just very Abrams. Yeah. Because there are these random creatures that Han Solo is supposed to be smuggling that are just like fucking rejects from the Cloverfield pile. Yeah. They're just like teeth tentacle things. Or that snow creature from Star Trek, the first Star Trek. Yeah, or, or like, that snow creature from the second Star Trek. I bet there was one. Or the monster from Super 8. He designs monsters in a very similar way. All the other creatures in this film look like Star Wars creatures. And in this, this is like, this is like a J.J. creature. Anyway, a bunch of British pirates come on. Cool bad guy enforcers, and a bunch of actors from the raid come on, do no stunts whatsoever. Who was the Scottish or whatever guy? Didn't know, but I liked him. Yeah. I mean, I didn't like this sequence. I think the idea is like, Han, he's up to his smuggler ways again. Yeah. Oh, he's got everyone on the go. And th that's kind of cute where he's yeah. like playing them off of each other. But then just a bunch of shit occurs, and it's just an excuse for them to get in the Falcon and get out of there. Which they do. So whatever. Whatever. I don't really want to dwell on that scene. It's not good. I don't remember where it happens in the chronology of the film, but at one point, a uh, underling comes up to Kylo Ren and tells him that the girl and the droid got away. And he, like, takes a deep breath, Freaks and takes out. out his lightsaber, and just, like, cuts up no, the no, no. wall. No, like no, a here's computer like. console. He says, the droid got away. Ren cuts up the wall with his lightsaber, throws a tamper tantrum. Right, right. And then he Like a says, little baby. Then the guy's like, he was with a girl, and Kylo Ren just pulls him over with, oh, his, with him. the force and is like, girl! Yeah. So two levels of, uh, you know. Yes. Uh, so let's talk about Kylo but Ren. But he also, much like Finn and Rey, is like a child. He's he a is. child who's trying to be seen as an adult. And who's in the shadow of these movies, of these so, original movies. I don't remember let's when it happens. Let's talk about Kylo it happens Ren. Pretty shortly when is after it this? revealed? It's about 40 minutes into Around the this movie. Time. Yeah. General Hux played by Donald Gleason and Kylo Ren go to report to Supreme Leader Snoke. Kylo Ren does not seem to be part of the First Order proper. He seems to be like someone they hire on, you know, to help them with it because they have similar interests. You know, the uh, enemy of my enemy is my friend kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but Donald Gleason is directly, you know, both of them seem to be taking direct orders from Snoke. This is my least favorite thing in the movie. Uh, this is your least favorite? Oh, Snoke. Yes. Mine too. Um, the he, stakes are high for this character and they, they whip. Ben will love it. He's big. He's really big. At least he's projected as big. Well, that's the dumb like twist. But then I didn't think it no was payoff. dumb. I thought it was fine. They walk into a room. There's a guy who's like seventy thousand feet tall, sitting on a seventy thousand foot throne. He looks like a very nondescript like CGI motion capture thing. Yeah. In interviews, Andy Circus had said Andy Circus plays Snoke, mm -hmm. and people were like, "Oh, J.J. Abrams is like you know selling the practical essence of the film. Why is this character going to be motion captured?" 
And he was like, I think when you see the character, you'll understand why physically it couldn't be done with makeup and prosthetics. Right. Nope. I uh, don't see that. Don't even see why it had to be done with CGI. No. Now, I did read that this character's design was settled on late in the process. Would not be surprised. Because I think they just went through a lot of stuff. Yeah. They settled on a very generic look. He's this sort of bald, scarred, weird sort of baby-looking freak. One of his ears is missing. He's he lo- missing a big chunk of his cheek. But they could have done that as CGI augmentation, He too. looks like... The fuck? What's the kid in the Goonies? The kid in the Goonies? You're talking about Chunk? Yeah, sort of. <laughs> uh, I had an analogy last night that I, I was really proud of. I think he looks like the Voldemort on the back of Professor Quirrell's head in the original Harry yeah, that, Potter. Yeah, and that's fair. It's just because it's like it's featureless almost. It's sort of nondescript. And it also feels like a placeholder kind of thing in the same way that for the first Harry yeah, Potter they were, they like, were we'll, like, we'll get his look We'll later. get to it later. We just need to evoke an idea. Um, but I remember hearing rumors that like Snoke was going to be like a fucking snake and like shit like that. So he's a big guy and he's a hologram that is bigger. We've only all ever seen holograms that are tiny and now he's a big hologram. Ben will love it. But he's just kind of um, visually bland and not really well explained. I would have liked a little more Snoke or a little more fleshing out of Snoke. But the big thing he drops. And it's, it. it's he who drops it. It's he who drops it. And he mentions it offhandedly because they all know. He yeah. just mentions it as part of a sentence. They go, they're with your father, Han Solo. That's where the twist is revealed. It's amazing. This movie's already leaving me. Okay, crazy. And it's also like it's, 50 minutes into the movie. We just like stiffened up. Yeah. Because, like, congratulations, Abrams. You did it. You kept that completely in the dark. And you and I turned to each other and we're like, did I just hear that right? We were just like, okay, okay. That's how I felt. I was like, all right, all right. Just keep moving. The movie doesn't take any time to, like, fucking land that punch and, like, deal with the reverberations. It just keeps moving. It is the puzzle piece to this world that Abrams has decided on, which is this world where the three main characters are sort of scattered to the winds. And it's that Luke unseen in this movie until the very end. Luke uh, tra- was trying to train a new order mm-hmm. of Jedis and Han and Leia's kid turned to the dark side. This kid, you know, Ben is his name. Yeah. And that ben tragedy, Solo. which is a seismic tragedy, yeah. is what kind of like put them all in their own direction. So Han goes back to being a smuggler, kind of haunted by it. Leia just like bur- burrows down with, as like a general in the resistance. And Luke goes off to try and find the first Jedi temple on some sort of, you know, vision quest, essentially. But he just doesn't want to fucking, he's like, well, look at what, how much damage I've caused, you know? How much I hurt my best friend and my sister. I don't want to be doing this anymore. Um, Kylo Ren uh, is a great character. Great performance by Adam Driver. Immediately, the childish tantrum sort of makes sense where it's like, this is a guy really at odds with himself. And who lives in the shadow of Darth Vader? He's obsessed with Darth Vader, his Han grandfather, Solo, yeah. and Princess Leia, and, and kind Luke of Luke Skywalker. Skywalker. Yeah, um, I think there is. But like, talk about three movies Lucas had to make yeah. an impetuous, yep, uh, privileged, you know, sort of Jedi like burdened by the weight of expectation. Yeah, blew it, blew it, blew it. Adam Driver kills it. Yeah, but the character is also very well written and very the well conceived. The character is well written, but well cast. Oh, he kills it. Because, like, Adam Driver has been having tantrums on girls for years. Yeah. He throws a great tantrum. But this is a different tenor of tantrum, you know? Yeah, for sure. It's got a different texture to it, and it's unnerving. He is scarier because of how human he is and how foyable he is and how scared he is, you know? Yeah. Like, and, and um, there's the moment where he's talking to the Darth Vader helmet. I mean, they reveal it as the Darth Vader helmet. But he's essentially, like, the biggest Darth Vader nerd in the world. And, and yes. he's, like, talking to the helmet about how scared he is and that he feels being pulled to the light right. side. Right, he, he, he's struggling with it. He's like, just let me out of this. I don't want to be a fucking good guy. I think this movie, it, it, this is a very meta movie. And, you know, I agree with what J.D. Amato said when he was on this podcast, that, like, every film is in some way about the person who made it. You know, every film is kind of autobiographical. It's about mm-hmm. the filmmaker. And I think this movie is, these three characters are so defined by their relation to what has come before in this galaxy. That this is a movie about, like, trying to understand the weight of what Star Wars is in our culture. Because, like, 30 years have passed, 40 years have passed, and these kids are, like, coming to terms with what happened before they were born. Yeah. And trying to continue the legacy. Yeah. And he feels like his legacy is to continue being Darth Vader. That there needs to be a Darth Vader in the world. Sure. You know? Um, and, and Finn is trying to figure out where he fits within the structure. I mean, it's, it's really smart. Right. Now. I mean, the way Han and Leia put it is like he had too much Vader in him. That's like their sort of 
or at least that's Han's yeah. rationalization. Well, it's also the sins of the father thing. Like, like every child inherits the good and the bad of their parents, and you can't tell which side's going to win out, you know? Yeah. And this is writ large. The bad is thoroughly evil, not just like, oh, he's, a, you know, no, yeah, a little right. emotionally disconnected. But, like, this movie is setting the same vague arc in motion for yeah. Kylo Ren, which is, like, a possible redemption. It's the, yes. Yeah. It is. You yeah. know, like, and not saying, like, that's absolutely where the movie has to be pointed towards. We don't know, but it feels but like. But, like, it. Leia certainly is convinced, like, he's not lost to us forever. We could get him back. And um, I get chills just thinking about the directions they could go with this character in the next two movies. Like, who knows where they're going, but I play Me out too. my mind some of the possibilities, and they're all equally exciting. Yeah, I agree. I love Kylo Ren. He's a great fucking Character. Cool character. Like the way you can hear Driver's voice even in the modulation yes. when he's got the helmet on. Uh, I like that he's an unscarred, you know. He's no Vader. Yeah. Vader wore that mask for a reason. You're not quite sure why Kylo Ren wears his mask. Like He's obsessed with Darth Vader. Except, except he's right. a Star Wars except nerd and he an wants acolyte. to be as cool as the Star Wars characters. And yeah. he also, someone tweeted today, but like he's very much, I, I feel like it is that is a character of our time. He feels very much like a, a Gamergate kind of guy. I like, guess so. Yeah. He's he's this guy with a sort of impotent rage. He, he, he's angry right. yes. at the yes. world. He's angry at the world, and he has no good reason to be, right. except like this sort of vague thing he latches onto, which is like, well, Darth Vader was my grandfather. And and the fact that Darth Vader had that much power, had more power than anyone ever had, is the most appealing thing to him. Right. Like He just wants to be powerful, and he wants to be... The the big, the biggest mystery that needs to be clarified, and I assume will be a part of these later movies, mm -hmm. is like what role is Snoke play in this? Is he an important one? Is he like the Emperor to you know Ren's Vader? Yeah. And like, how's that going to play out? And can it play out differently? Please. I thought there was going to be a Snoke twist, and there wasn't. They there just wasn't. leave him very. Perhaps big. there's some. I mean, I'll say Abrams is a mystery box guy. He puts a lot of mysteries in a box. He doesn't let most of them out. I will say also, I just had a disassociative moment where I just was like, oh, right, we've seen this movie and we're talking about it. Yeah, it's crazy. This isn't speculation. Because I had in my head... We speculated. I mean, and people on the internet speculated for so long about this fucking movie. Well, you were saying to me that you were so surprised by um, Kylo being Han Sun because you hadn't even thought of it. I hadn't even thought of it. And I said, I've thought of it because I've thought of every single option. But I was... Because I thought through everything that could happen, I was equally surprised. I had made an effort not to think too hard, I'll admit. I thought way too hard about it. Uh, but but yeah. every time a scene happened in the movie, I was crossing six scenes off the list, which was surprising to me, you know? There was so much about Luke, you know, yeah. why aren't we seeing Luke? Where's Luke? Why isn't Luke in this? Like, where is he in the promotional he's, about. he's the MacGuffin. And the thing is, yeah, he's literally, there are two shots of Luke, one of his hand in a dream that Ray has, and then yeah. his face right at the end. Well, so let's get to that. That's the next part of the film. They go down to a bar run by Maz Kaneda. Yeah, so Han Solo leads them over to this bar where he's, he's like, like, I know someone we'll figure shit out. Yeah. Maz is, so this bar is like a Mos Eisley Cantina analog. Yeah. yeah. Maz is is kind of like a chirpy old lady version of Yoda, I I'd guess. I'd say she's like Yoda meets B. Arthur's character from the Holiday Special. Yeah, I think that her closest analog is B. Arthur's character in the Holiday Special. Yeah. Tune in next week to hear us discuss B. Arthur's performance in Star Wars, the Holiday Special. Maybe my second favorite performance in the Star Wars universe. It's probably my favorite performance given in a film. Yeah, probably. Uh, maybe my favorite character ever. Stuff. Maybe my the my favorite thing about us as a human race. Yeah, I'd say. It's anyway, the, she's great. The, my favorite uh thing that has uh, ever happened in my life uh, was getting to watch that performance. Yeah. Anyway, that's who she's sort of playing, and she looks um a lot like my grandmother. Uh, it needs to be said. Uh, Maz Kaneda looks and moves a lot like my dead grandmother. It was a little unnerving to me. My grandmother was also tiny. She wore a lot of bangles and, and bracelets and then had tiny eyes and oversized glasses. Maz Kaneda has like these goggles that she like has toggles and she like adjusts them to make her eyes bigger or smaller. And at one point she flips away and her eyes are like microscopic. And that reminds me of my grandma, Rosie, who is dead. R.I.P. Rosie. She died in 2004. Uh, right after I saw Spider-Man 2, I got the news. Uh, I'm sorry. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. Um, anyway. Maz Kaneda. Yeah. Kaneda? Kaneda. Kaneda. Um, Played by Academy Award winner Lupita Nyong'o. Great actress. Uh, I like this performance. You didn't so much. Or you were okay with it. We'll talk I, about it. Yeah, we'll talk about it later. Um, 
she, we, you know, she sees right through everything. She's like a thousand years old. She's, she's got like, these goggles yeah. that are like peepers. You yeah. know, she can kind of like, I mean, the way the movie very vaguely puts it is she's no Jedi, but she's almost like force goggles. Like she can just sort she of see it. the force. She knows it. It's a lot like the His Dark Materials books where like, mm. I don't know if you've read them, but where like dust, which is the sort of magical transitive thing. Uh, kind of settles around people. Mm -hmm. And I just assume she just, you know, she's kind of picking up on auras. She's exactly. sort of like a horny crystal lady. Yeah. She's got a real crush on Chewbacca. Oh, she loves it. She, which, she which calls my, him my boyfriend. Which was my favorite part of her uh, yeah, appearances because, in these movies. Yeah. And I hope she comes back and I assume she will. She will, definitely. And uh, because, like, she has Luke Skywalker's lightsaber and Han Solo is like, where the fuck did you get that? Which is a good question because it, the last we saw it, it was on Cloud City. Well, she also immediately identifies... Finn, and she's like, I can see through you. You're scared, and you're running. And he, like, drops the act. There's the great moment where, like, Finn is trying to sell, this happens earlier, we skipped over this, where Finn is trying to sell to Han Solo yeah, that he's he like a resistance the illusion, member. and he's like, yeah. I'm kind of a big deal. And he's like, okay, big okay, deal. Big deal. But women, big deal. And he says, but women are always Yeah, he's like, can I give you one piece of yeah. advice? Yeah. Um, and so, like, Han Solo, like, sees himself, I think, in Finn, calls him out on it, but he's still lying to Rey. And he, like, comes clean at this moment. He does, because Maz can see through him. Yeah. Right. And he's like, I'm a stormtrooper. I'm not a resistance fighter. I, I'm not supposed to be here. I just need to... Yeah. She sees through him. Yeah. And she... But She's... the thing is, in the central point of this scene is that yeah. this, the, this, the lightsaber calls out to Rey. She hears, like, an echo. She goes down she to goes, the basement. She goes, she gets it, and, and she has box. these visions, which I need to see the movie again to just sort of, like... Get a little more of a crystal clear sense of what she's seeing, but she they're sees very dense. Herself being yeah. abandoned, she sees a flash of Luke with his robot arm touching yeah. R two and rain, yeah. and like a showdown with Kylo Ren. Like yeah. she sees a lot of stuff. Yeah, it terrifies her. She runs away. It's the refusal of the call. Maz Kaneda is like that lightsaber called to you. Yeah, it's she's like it's to, you. It's you. Called to two people before. You need to take that. And she's like, I'm not fucking touching that thing ever again. Yeah, sorry, buddy, you are. Yeah, but um. So, but, like, it's the refusal of the call. Yeah. Ray's out of there. Yeah. And then she gets sucked up by the invading Imperial force. Uh, we, you know, we don't even really need to talk about it. The First Order shows up and kind of fucks it up. Does that happen? Yeah. So she doesn't meet Leia at that point in the movie? No, Leia's not a Maskinatus thing. Where did, where did, when she lands her ship? Leia? Yeah. That's scene oh, where yeah, they... Leia is there. Right. She doesn't meet Leia though, because Leia's like she only meets Leia later. Or I, it doesn't matter. I, I, come on, we, you know. Yeah, we need but, to see um, this movie again. But yeah. but Finn gets the lightsaber, which is kind of weird. Maz yeah. Kanata's like, all right, well you take. Someone it. should take it. I think she just sort of knows like it'll end up in the right spot. I think Maz Kanata's been around the block. She understands how shit works. Uh, Finn's like, I'm getting out of here. Yeah, the call is being refused at this point. From both Han Solo, them. literally saying to them like, work with me. I like you kids. Yeah. And they're like both like I don't know. We don't like, know if we want to be the like, leads in a new Star get Wars out of movie. Here. We don't know if we yeah, can carry Ray, that. Well, yeah. after being so excited about being leads in the, because yeah. like the scenes in the Falcon earlier are them yeah. being like, I can't believe it, we're in the Star Wars movie. But they're like, maybe they're calling our bluff. Yeah, now maybe they're like, oh shit's getting real. Overseas box office, you know, is built on pre pre established names. We don't know if we're going to do well in those territories. Um, so Finn is like, you know, Maskinet is like, hey, I know some guys who are leaving. You can hitch a ride with them. Yeah. And Ray just sort of runs off with BB-8. And there in the forest, she runs into Kylo, Kylo Ren, Ren, who freezes her in the same way. that, And he's like, you have the information I need. Yeah. You're coming with me. Yeah. So he takes her. BB-8 rolls away. BB-8 rolls away, hooks back up with everyone else. Right, right. So, right. So this so is what th these are. I think this is where people who are complaining about this movie start to be like, all right, everything's a little convenient. My yeah, problem is I That's I how Star care. Wars works. Yeah, I don't I care. If the movie works when I'm watching it, I don't care. So, right, Ray gets kidnapped, BB-8 rolls away, finds Finn, Han Solo, uh, and Chewbacca, who are in the forest when a ship lands, and who gets off that ship but General Leia Organa. Carrie Fisher. Giving what I'll, I'll call right now my favorite performance in the movie. She's terrific. She doesn't have a ton of screen time. She's got a good amount. No, she's fi it's fine. She comes in late, but once she comes in, she's got a good amount. Um, I was so astonished by, the first thing is, Jesus Christ, like, you talk about dust, you talk about force aura, the fucking chemistry between Harrison Ford and Carrie Fisher is just, like, some weird energy source that has not diminished at all. The second they come on screen and they're in the same frame together, it's just silence. She gets off the ship, they look at each other, and the whole audience gets chills, because it's like, ooh, this is a sexy couple. Yeah. They're old, they're gray, but they're fucking sexy couple. Yeah, and, like, there's a lot unresolved, but we understand what sort of drove them apart. 
And, and she's she loves him. They're sharing this moment, and then what happens? Of course, C-3PO. immediately pokes his head in on game. It's JJ, good. it's a very on good game. Of of all the introductions of of past characters, it's it's the most on yeah. point. Yes. Oh, oh, Mr. Solo. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah I don't yeah, know yeah, if you yeah. recognize me because of my red arm. Yeah, great joke. I think it was a great joke because it's never explained again. He's got a red arm. I don't know. Right. Uh, great joke. But he's obviously very hung up on his red arm because he's always hung up on his appendages. Yeah. Uh, Han and... And this is the first performance. This is the first real performance Carrie Fisher has delivered since I don't even know when. That's why I like, was so surprised. She's been in movies, but they're usually little movies like or the yeah, fucking small cameo. Family Therapist and Austin Powers or like The Nun and Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back. I can't remember the last time. I mean, it might be like... When Harry Met Sally? When Harry Met Sally. Yeah. That's why I was so impressed. And she's she like, has like a decent part in Drop Dead Fred. Okay. Like, but you know, yeah, I mean, she she gives little cameos all the time. That's She, it. you know, was a great actress, but in the last 20 years has mostly reinvented herself as like a novelist, you know. A humorist. A humorist. A writer. Did, you know, off, a screenplay uh, did a Broadway one woman show. She did show. Wishful Drinking. Yeah. Right. But it sort of made herself more of like a, a humor personality. Yeah. And an advocate for electroshock therapy. Right. Yeah. I remember Remember she was on Craig Ferguson once. It was like obviously really trying to because Craig Ferguson is this fellow recovering yeah. alcoholic. Trying to really get him into it, and Craig Ferguson was very obviously like, "Yeah, I'm not gonna do Let's this." Let's not talk about she's this. Like, Craig, it's great. Yeah. Anyway, she's great in that episode of Thirty Rock. Uh, yes, but but this is the first time we've seen her take on like a real meaty role, and you immediately like are when when Carrie Fisher goes on like the Today Show with her dog and is fucking razor sharp and super funny for ten she's minutes, the best. maybe the best interview in the history of television. She's the best. You're like. Oh man, Princess Leia really was a long time ago. Like this woman is is lifetimes beyond that. It's true. And so you go, is she going to be able to capture the same spirit of Princess Leia? And she totally does. The second she walks on screen, you go, this isn't Carrie Fisher. This is Princess Leia. And she's older and wiser, but she also feels like she has less to prove. You know, she's not giving like, you know, I mean, Princess Leia in the first like two movies especially is like fuck you to everybody because everyone undervalues her right no one takes her seriously right and in this she's general leia organa she doesn't have anything to prove she just fucking is and her banter with han is immediately amazing i'm coming everywhere we have complaints in the theater complaints yeah because i was coming too much yeah. i also i should mention went to the movie dressed as Watto. you did i was dressed as Watto. He looked great. I looked great. Um, so they're talking. They explain the whole situation, and they're like, we're going to help you find that girl. Yeah. You got a new girl? We're going to help you find that girl. Yeah, I think they keep doing this thing where uh, Han is, like, talking about Ray or about to talk about Ray. They mm-hmm. do it with Maskatana and I think Makatena, and they do it with Leia, mm-hmm. where they cut away before he actually says anything about her. Yeah. I think to li- to dangle some mystery. Sure. As they, they go like, who's this girl? And then they cut away and shit like that. And because like, could Ray be like Luke's kid? I really could hope Ray, not. Uh, you know, who knows? I'd be really happy if she has no relation. And the fact that they don't show who her parents are. So we were talking about this afterwards. There is that flashback when she touches the lightsaber and you see her as a little girl crying and being held back by the Simon Pegg character as the ship leaves and her parents leave, right? Yeah. She is young, but she is old enough that she would remember her parents, remember what they looked like, who they were, right? She's yeah. like five, maybe. Um, and so I don't think her parents are anyone she meets within the movie. And she is so, like, such a fan of, like, the Luke Skywalker lore, Han Solo as a smuggler. Like, she knows the Star Wars stories, that if it was any of those people, she would know that. My hope is her parents will be revealed in a future film to be new characters who have an important place. Yeah, in I think galaxy. it's going to be Luke. I really hope it is. Yeah, I think it's like Luke put her in someone else's arms, much as he was put in someone's arms, and, and then those people was... left her. Yes, I think that's so convoluted. I hope it's new characters. Yeah, I really hope they don't do that. We'll see. Really hope they don't. Anyway, we've talked for a long time. Yeah, I think we've talked about everything we love about this movie. F- Finn. Was it gonna get on the ship with the other people? Yeah, and it's like, no, I'm a fucking. I'm he a makes hero a decision now. to go get Ray. Right, they get back to the base. He's motivated to go get Ray. Sees Poe Dameron again. He's, He's like, like you hey, steal my you jacket, buddy. Keep my jacket. You're He's great. Like, Looks good on you. And everyone's like, he keeps on confessing to people from this point on that he's a stormtrooper, like with shame. And they're like, that's great. 
you thank you you're here now chose to, to be a stuff. good guy and yeah. you get to help us out now like it doesn't matter where you it's were born call. it matters what you choose to be then there's this scene a that hero I, can come from anywhere I, i'll say as a fan of cinema i felt was superfluous there's this 20 minute wedding scene between me and poe dameron yeah that's that was yes like then i enter the film and i am married to poe dameron in a moving wedding ceremony that's right. like obviously was the highlight of my life right and there's also there is that 45 minute section where i take daisy really at the noodles in my neighborhood and and have a really tough time making eye contact with her. And she interprets that as me not being interested, but it's actually because I'm so interested that I can't function. And then the next six months are us having weird conversations. And then like it cuts <laughs> right, then okay, to right. like five years later, and we admit that we both had a crush on each other at the time, but we couldn't act upon it. All right, Griffin. How you doing? Good. The movie's great. Great movie. Anyway, Poe Dameron, he's back. He's not dead. The movie like kind of pretends he's dead. He's not dead. Yeah. You know, there's a, a character, Merchandise Spotlight, there's a character named Constable Zuvio. Uh-huh. Who is all over the toys? They made him in like multiple sizes, like a six inch and a three and a three quarter inch, and like a lot of him. And he's like wearing like sort of like robes, and then he's got like a cone hat and a weird mm. alien eye, and his face is covered by like a scarf, right? Uh huh. And the like the bio on the back of the toys, because but when the movie wasn't coming out, you read the bio. That's all you had to go off of. Was like Constable Zuvio is a law enforcer who patrols Jakku and chases our heroes. Mm. This character is not in the movie. Yeah, he, I think he has one scene. No. No? He, in the flashback of Ray as a little girl, mm. you see him in, like, silhouette. When uh-huh. she touches the lightsaber, you see him in silhouette. He's not in the film. Okay. There are theories that there was a sequence or two sure. shot in the movie of Poe when he crashes somewhere Running different this guy. being yeah. chased by this guy. Anyway, that's all cut. All cut. But we just figure it out. He was thrown from the TIE fighter, and he, he made it back. Yeah. Anyway. From what? this point on, I mean, it's like classic Star Wars. It movie. is. I mean, it's almost a, a little over. too classic. We'll hit the basic, the the big thing that we have to talk about. But like, once again, they identify it's, within Star yeah, Killer. It's Base. honestly the only big thing because oh, yeah. we didn't even talk. Star Killer Base is like Death Star Six. No, but we should talk about yeah. Star Killer Base is their death weapon. That's fine, but it blows up <laughs> the Republic. Yeah, which is a decision that I've already heard some people are a little upset about because it is done so. Quickly. It's quickly, it's tossed off. Yeah. And it's Abrams making this choice of like, look, this movie is not about a stable time. Mm-hmm. And it's not about like the Republic and the politics of the Republic. So mm-hmm. there won't be a Republic, basically. Mm-hmm. Fine. But you're, you've got nothing in this moment. It's not a good moment. It's not a good moment. The Starkiller base thing sucks. It shoots from like so far away. There's no sense of destruction, really. And it's like, oh, it shoots six beams instead Fucking of one. Fucking sucked. There was an interview with J.J. Abrams where they were like, so you're doing another Death Star? And he's like, I totally think when you different. see the movie, totally you're going to see it's totally different. It's like, oh, no, it's, it's the same. bigger and it shoots six things And the movie of has a joke where they're like, it's just the Death Star. And they're like, no, uh, here's the Death Star, calls up holograph. Uh, here's Starkiller Base, much bigger holograph. Right, it's like a cherry next to a watermelon. And you're like, Who great, gives a uh-huh, shit? we get it, it's bigger. And then Han Solo's sort of like, well, I don't know, we blow it up. There's always some way to blow it up. Yeah. And they're immediately like, here's its weak point right here. We'll figure it out. I like that Like when they showed the diagram of how to blow it up, it was like the same kind of classic wireframe like computer animation to be like, oh, this is just how like military strategists visualize their plans. Is just with like wireframe 1977 yeah, 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 CGI. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but they find the one spot, yeah. Poe but Dameron it is literally and like, his crew. Poe's like, great, we'll hit that spot. We need the shield to go down. And Finn's like, got it. I can bring down your shield just like on Endor, but, right. you know, without saying it. Han Solo's like, cool, we're going to do it. I already have a plan. Let's go. Let's get out. You know, let's bundle everyone into their ships. Let's yeah. go. Let's go. Let's, let's go. Let's bundle ourselves up in some warm Leia's, winter coats. Leia's like, remember Star Wars when I was watching the action from the base? Yeah. That's what we're going to do right gonna now. Do this. 3PO's going to be next to me griping. Yeah. Like, yeah. This is the stuff that I do think, like, eh. Yeah, you know, but it's fun on. when you're watching it. If you break it apart now it's and you're l- viewing it under the microscope, I just wish like the dog fighting was a little better. It's fine. The action isn't great. Uh, there's this sort of half-hearted trench run sequence. Mm. Uh, best thing is that Admiral Akbar is there. Akbar's there. Mia Num is there. Yep. Um, Ken Long. Ken Lung is there. You were very excited. You were I like, love him. There He's was a like, great I love him too, but you were like, is that Ken Lung? Yeah. And I was like, I was like Griffin, you. shut up. I don't care. Ken Lung. He's also very recognizable. Yeah. But he was out of focus at that point. Um, we, we forgot a big thing. R2-D2 is on the base. He is on standby mode. What are you writing? Uh, I'm looking up something, but oh, go gotcha. ahead. Uh, R2-D2 is on standby mode. 
and uh, they're like, uh, what's this? And they're like, oh, uh, C-3PO's like, r 2 he's been on standby mode forever. People You're- are very annoyed about this. They say it's a literal deus ex machina because he's a machine. They're like, they're not going to wake you up. Oh, because when they, they take the flash drive out of BB-8 when they get to the base and they project the map to Luke Skywalker. And they're like, this isn't the whole map. This is a piece of a map. Someone else has the piece of the map. And someone even says like, you think R2-D2 has it? And they're like, probably not. And also he's asleep. I don't have a problem with this scene. You do. Everyone else seems to. I don't care. It's like the idea is like, I think I think of it as like R2-D2 is playing the same function he always has. Yeah. He's a step ahead of everyone else. And he's waiting until the, sh- the right moment to deploy his information. You know what I mean? Yes. Like, I'm R2 fine. is like, I need for the people to show up. Mm-hmm. The people. The people. Ray, Finn, whoever. The people. And then I'll wake up and lead him to Luke. I'm fine with that. What I don't like is there's literally a line where C-3PO says, like, but I don't think he has the map. Like, if they had said, like, we don't know. We can't wake him up. Maybe he has it. But for them to be like, he probably doesn't have it, is them just being like, trying to send us on, like, a red herring of a red herring, you know? Yeah. Don't like that. Um, Trench Run, Poe Dameron and his team, including Greg Grumberg. Um, don't even want to talk about it. No. But it I sort like, of sucks. When they're cutting to all the different pilots, it's like, oh, we have an Asian woman, we have a black man, we That's have fine. aliens, we they have a fat guy with a beard. It's more. Di- it's much more diverse. Return of the Jedi, there's a black guy, there's an Asian guy, there's, you know, whatever. This is much more diverse. I don't care. Even the, back the, on the base. The, Important, the, you don't care? No, I don't care. The trench run is it's a disaster. Not a, it's the worst part, and it's a disaster that they don't give Poe Dameron a hero moment. Yeah, it just feels like an inevitable. Like the there's only no thing I like sequence. is yeah. Black Leader. He's Black Squadron. Oh sure. Too long has Black been associated with just like you know the bad guys or whatever. Yeah, and his X wing's black. It's cool. Cool. Um, the stuff with uh, uh, Finn and Chewie and Han is cool. He reveals that he was a sanitation guy, that he doesn't know what he's doing. Um, and then they uh, invade the base. He puts Phasma in a garbage compactor. They try to find Ray. Oh, most important scene in the entire film. Uh, Ray is, like, tied to a torture thing. Did you hear about who played the stormtrooper in this scene? Yes. Um, he, uh, Kylo Ren was trying to get information out of her. Uh, she wouldn't give up. He had another tantrum. Um, she's like, why don't you take off your mask? He takes off his mask. You see his face. M. Driver gives a great performance. Right, and he tries to tap into her brain, and of course, as we've already guessed, she sort of is just naturally blessed with the Force. She's Force And sense. resists him. Yeah. And then not long later, uses her first Force power, Jedi Daniel Mind Craig, Trick, to get a Stormtrooper, a Stormtrooper played by Daniel Craig, uncredited, yeah. Yeah. to free her. Great right. scene. But it's a great scene because it doesn't work. She goes like, you're going to free like, me from this and leave the door open. restraints, yeah. damn it. She just stays calm and says it four times until it finally works. And she's out. She's on her own trying to get through. Finn dismantling the shields. They're like, great. Oh, but what about Ray? We're going to have to save Ray. And Han Solo is like, look over your fucking shoulder, kid. And Ray's just like climbing a wall. Boom. And they Once again, they don't need to save her. Yeah. And they're like, hey. And she's like, hey. And then they have this moment. And other, they're like, what are you doing here? And they're like, we came, we came back here for you. And she's very happy. You're our friend. And in other movies, in lesser movies, it feels like they would kiss at this moment because they are a boy and a girl, and they're both good-looking, charismatic kids, and that's what they would do. And instead, they just hug. And there's a lot in that moment, I think, because it doesn't say that they don't want to kiss each other. No. But it's also the movie saying we're not going to reduce it to that. Yeah. They can have a, a friendship that, first. That hasn't been figured out at this moment, but she And also, they haven't figured that out within themselves. They she don't finally know. has a family. She finally has a family, but they don't know how they feel about each other. It's like how it's going to be when Daisy Ridley and I go on a date. It's going to take a while to express those emotions. So, they're running through. They get to a bridge. Kylo Ren is there. Han Solo's like, I have to face him. And Snoke said to him, like, Snoke has said this is your greatest test, essentially. You got to know what you have to do. So we kind of know what's coming because the way the scene is framed is so obviously like the Obi-Wan Darth Vader fight where uh, Finn and Rey are in the distance watching. Chewbacca's around like planting charges. Yeah. Um, And they're facing off, but like peacefully facing off. Yes. And Kylo Ren is really sad. He's Ben. He's called Ben by mm-hmm. his dad for the first time. And his dad's saying, like, forget Snoke. He's got his power over you. And Ren's like, I'm so conflicted. I'm so messed up. But what he's saying is, like, I really need to shed you. Yeah. And I need to shed my yeah, family. He's like, I know what I need to do. I know what I need to do. Can you help me? Right. And Han Solo maybe thinks he's helping him. Maybe not. They, but he kills him. 
He looks like he's handing over the lightsaber, I mean, and then once it's in Han Solo's okay. hand. Yeah. yeah. But it's still a very powerful moment. And uh, friends new and old, Chewbacca, Finn, Ray, all scream out. And they're like, we just we got to fucking get out of here. Um, <sighs> Poor so they, Han Solo. Yeah. He dies. He's they they, they get it basically right. It's a tough thing to right. do I to kill off a right. very iconic character. Um, and so, I wonder if this is one reason that people are upset, that people who don't like the movie. Uh, are upset. I can't tell. I don't know. Um, the place is going to blow. They want to the get off the The thing is, base. like, Harrison Ford's your, he's such a star that if he's in this, these movies, you're always going to want to see him. And I think they just know, like, he's got to pass the torch, right? It gives stakes. And, and it makes more sense. The way things are set up right now, there is greater function for Leia and Luke in future movies than Sure. Him. I mean, they can each have their sort of moments. Right now, they're still sort of background. And they have clear roles. This was Han's movie. Like, Luke is the last Jedi Master. Yeah. Leia is the general of the resistance. Han is, once again, just like a scoundrel. Mm-hmm. And he has this sort of redemptive moment here, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, he dies trying to save someone else, his son. Mm-hmm. Um, and also, of course, it, it puts a lot onto Kylo Ren as like, you're bad guy. Right, it makes him this real. This is no yeah. tantrum haver only. You know, right. like, this is the guy who killed Han Solo. His dad. It's a real bad guy. Killed his dad. Yeah. That's the bigger Fratricide. thing. Fratricide. No, that's brother. Uh, Patricide. Yeah. Uh, so Finn and Ray are trying to get off with Chewbacca. Um, Starkiller Base, which is essentially like Hoth. Um, and they're trying to escape, and they run into Kylo Ren, who chases them down. Yeah, so then we have this final showdown in the in the woods, in the wintry woods of Starkiller Base, which is pretty good, I would say. I'd again, say second best. Yeah, again, yeah. not as dynamic as lightsaber fights we've seen in the past, but almost supposed to be because first you have Finn, who has the lightsaber, barely knows what he's doing, right. is kind of trying to just fight off. Mm-hmm. And then you have Rey, who at first, I, I mean, literally Kylo Ren says, like, you need training, but you could be great. And then she kind of, like you know, advances to level two in the in her force powers and kind of just like, you know. Yeah, they, I mean, they the throw great moment where better. the lightsaber has been cast aside and Kylo Ren's trying to pull it back to him with the force. Right, and she gets it. And then she gets it first because her force is more powerful. I've heard people complaining about how powerful she is when she's hasn't been trained. Oh, who gives a shit? Fuck I, off. I agree. And I also think the way I interpret it is... No, it, it's it's... There's a point in the movie. There's always at the beginning you have all the power. It's like in the magicians, yeah. those books, right? You can do one big thing because it's sort of surging out of you, you know? I also think there's that moment where he goes, like, how did you get out? Uh, you know, when, when Finn asks her, like, how she freed herself She's from. She's like, I couldn't tell you. Like, I could, it's, yeah. it's, you wouldn't believe me it's if I crazy. said it. Yeah. And that infers to me that, like, She's had this feeling for a while, and I can just see, like, Ray in her hollowed out ATAT, just, like, testing moving stuff. Maybe. I, I think she's think been that. fucking with the idea for no, a little bit. I think Not, like, it's training herself, but she's I, had this feeling for a while. I disagree. I think it's disassociative. She, like, literally doesn't know what she's doing. I think doing. she's had the feeling for a while, but hasn't really had an outlet because to test it out. There's that moment where he says, you're good with the Force, and she's like, that's what this is, you know? Yeah. Well, I don't think she's been like, oh, let me train at the force. I think she's been in her we thing, don't need like to about shit. a thing that literally hasn't has doesn't happen in the movie. Well, that's a fun of talking about movies. Ugh. I don't think so. I think that it's like something she's locked away because I think the whole point is that she's locked it all away. I think she's been using it, and not knowing what it is, in very small doses away from everyone else. There's no argument. I mean, this there's, there's difference of opinion. Mm-hmm. It's a movie that leaves a lot for you to fill in. It's very Star Wars: A New Hopey. Yeah. This thing where it's like Starkiller Capace gets destroyed, fine. All the villains escape. Okay. You know, we don't know about Phasma, but yeah. I feel like she's going to come back. I do too. Uh, but certainly Hux and Kylo Ren escape. Yeah. Uh, everyone's a little worse for wear. Yep. Uh, Kylo Ren has like a scar on his face. Yeah, big scar across the Um, face. You know, Finn gets cut down, but he'll probably be okay. He's he, definitely going to be okay. I mean, yeah, Chewbacca deal. gathers him up. There's this suggestion in the film, which I like, which is that... Chewbacca kind of imprints on Finn the most. You know, mm-hmm. they kind of have a lot of scenes together. And that, like, you know, Finn can maybe, you know, be his new co-pilot. Yes. Uh, well, no, Ray would be his co-pilot. Ray yeah, drives no, the ship. But, no, but Ray goes off to... With Chewbacca. All right, fine. What, I'm just saying... Chewbacca's right. there with her at the All end. All right. Is he? Yeah. They fly the ship together. Chewbacca I goes with Ray at the end. Well, 100%. I didn't, see, I didn't see him. I just saw her. She's, she's the only one on screen. She doesn't climb up the mountain. Okay. Chewbacca's in the ship with her. 100%. I thought the film was because Finn's with them, though. They're both friends with them. They're all going to be friends together. No, but she David. leaves Finn at the base and is like, I'm sure I'll see you again, even yeah. though he's unconscious. Right, and then Chewbacca comes with her in the ship. Okay, I don't remember that. They'll meet up with Finn again. Chewbacca's in the ship. 
Uh, R2-D2 wakes up, unlocks the map. They find Luke. Yeah, this is all very cute. He flies and with very... Chewbacca and BB-8 to uh, the Isle of Skellig Michael in Ireland. Yeah. They don't to what is with... called the Jedi Steps. Yes. Uh, in the John Williams score in yeah. the soundtrack. Uh, and she walks up to the top and she sees a figure from behind wearing a robe. Turns around. Luke. He looks unbelievable. He looks terrific. He looks He's perfect. got a beard. He's got long hair. Yeah. You know, shoulder length. And he looks at her, and he does some really good face acting There's here. There's no talking. Conveys a lot. There's this irritating helicopter shot circling around them. Don't like that. That's the last shot of the movie. But she holds out the lightsaber, and he looks at her, and they stand there, and no one knows what's going to happen next. And that's the end of the movie. I would have liked a static shot Me of too. just the two of them framed at opposite sides of Me the too. One picture. star. Yep. <laughs> would have liked a static shot to end the film. One star. One star. Uh, we'll see again. Um, so... We've criticized a lot of things in this movie. We've loved a lot of things in this movie. We called it great a couple of times. Is it a great movie? No. Is it a great Star Wars movie? Yeah. I think it might be better than Return of the Jedi. I think so, too. My definitive Which is ranking, always the thing. Yeah. You know, with every prequel, we would always say, look, 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 yeah. look. We don't want... It's not going to eclipse Star Wars. Yeah. It's not going to eclipse The Empire Strikes Back. No. But maybe it can be better than Return of the Jedi. And that was always the baseline quality that everyone wanted in a new Star Wars movie. And the table is set perfectly for the future of this franchise. Like, we're, there's an exciting future ahead of us. I mean, Abrams has, I think, done his the job his corporate masters appointed, which is like, yeah, like, uh, you know, give us uh, some grounding, give us a world, give us some characters. Set the table. And set that table for us. Ryan Johnson will take the next film. He's a terrific hire. I love Ryan Johnson. W- with a more defined voice, someone who's going to be able to impart yeah. and, you know. And then the film will be put in the hands of a convicted war criminal, Colin Trevorrow. There's a lot of time. People die every day. Anything could happen. <laughs> That's, Griffin, come on. This is a podcast like that is going out to the world. Anything could happen. Take it easy. Anything take it could easy. happen. I'm Who not knows? the biggest fan of Colin Trevorrow's oeuvre. So nope. far, nope. didn't like either of the films he made. Who knows? Do you know who is a big fan of Colin Trevorrow's over? Uh, the Dark Lord Satan. And Colin Trevorrow. Those are the only two. <laughs> no, I, I, I like, I, we, 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 we joke around about him a lot, and I don't want to be too mean-spirited about him, because like, I do feel like I don't want to just be like a huge asshole lobbing like, grenades from the sidelines. Maybe make a different movie. It's hard to make movie. a movie. Was, I was not a big fan of his Jurassic World, which I feel like Bad movie. was in the same realm as this movie. Yeah, this nostalgia steep work that's trying to set up a new world. Yeah, and is constantly worried about and burdened by the past and referencing back to it. Mm-hmm. And I just think that Jurassic World did a terrible job of that, but still hit a home run in terms of like money. You know, hopefully hit a home run this in is going to outgrow all of. I agree, those but like records, I'm just yeah. saying, like if people are out there complaining, like oh it's a nostalgic movie, oh it's ripping off the better movie, oh you know like blah blah blah. Take a look at a movie like Jurassic World that tried the same tricks and failed. Yeah. It's not the easiest balancing act to pull off, and J.J. Abrams pulled it off. Of the three, I'm going to say something maybe controversial. Of the three movies that tried to do that kind of thing, though, I do think Creed is the best of the three. Love Creed. Creed is a movie Creed I think is, is the best of the three. close to my top ten of the year. Yeah, Jurassic World sucks. Star Wars Force Awakens is a lot of fun. I can't fun. think about other movies right now. It's weird. It's tough. I'm going to probably see it again tonight. Just because I feel like I need tomorrow. to reconcile it. I'm seeing it again Sunday. We're talking Friday. I have so. tickets on Sunday. Yeah. Um, this will be coming out on Monday. Uh, thank you for listening. I hope you've all seen it. Um. Otherwise, I I'm sorry that you listened to this. We told you not to if you haven't seen it. Yeah. Well, that was bad. That's idea. on you. That's some on... people like spoilers. Yeah, but they're dumb. You shouldn't. You shouldn't have us care. tell you People the movie. Can do them. You shouldn't have us tell you the movie. You should go see it. All right, well, let's fun stop criticizing our listeners. We're not criticizing our listeners. I'm only criticizing the Sith Lord. Mm, no, there's no Sith. If you listen to this before seeing the movie, no I think you're a Sith movie. Lord. That there were no Sith in this movie. Yeah, Kylo's a Knight of Ren. Um, Whatever that means. Thank Could you for listening. For we'll be back next week with the podcast holiday special. Yeah, next week podcast holiday special. After that. Uh, January is going to come and we're going to be a different thing. Yeah. It's going to be weird. Yeah. Uh, we still haven't really told you guys what we're doing. We'll do that in January. It's going to be hard because, you know, we've done Star Wars all year it just, and it's crazy. Us. We did it all. But look, I mean, like if you like movies and you like us talking, I think you'll still be happy. I think, I think so you'll still have fun. We just sort of came to the conclusion that we can't do Star Wars forever. Yeah. Uh, I'm very happy to not have to think about these movies all the time. I am as too. much as I'm going to see Force I, Awakens. As deep five more as times. I got in them, yeah. I, I am too. It's a little. Suffocating. I'm happy to let them go. I hope that you guys can run with us as we 
explore new things, talk about movies we love, movies we hate, movies that fascinate us. That's the common thread. They're going to all fascinate us. And and right now we're Luke and Leia swinging across the chasm. We, you, we just need you to trust us that we're going to take you to the other side. Um and I, th- I, th- I, I think we will. I yeah. think we're going to do it. I think we're going to pull it off. So uh, we have at least one off coming in January. And I, No, I think we're doing a whole series in January. We we're have to debate a, this. We're doing a mini series in January. I will. I refuse to debate it. We're we have to debate it. this. I have an alternate pitch that I want to give to you. And then we're going to move on to a director that w- who we're interested in. The, the, going forward, we might. Within the parameters. Our of next this show. two big mini series planned are director spotlights where we, where we will be going through one by one each of their films rather yeah, than doing 10 sort of episodes. The, yeah. We're never week. probably going to do the thing we did with the prequels again where we almost ridiculously, you know, over explored. We tried to find another. There's nothing. It, nothing worked in the same way. Um, but trust us, I think we got some fun stuff lined up for you. Uh, and you know, hey. A couple of years from now, we're going to talk about a little movie called Star Wars Episode Eight. Yeah, crazy. Yeah, uh, it's called Star Wars Episode Eight. Uh, Jar Jar's back. Yeah. Uh, no, I was going to say Star Wars Episode Eight: Monsters Unleashed. Monsters Unleashed uh, from Scooby Doo Two is my is still my favorite. Star Wars episode. episode Eight: Out of the Shadows. Yeah, as the new Teenage Mutant oh, Ninja, Ninja Turtles, Turtles movie is called. Yeah, it looks very brightly lit. Um, thank you for listening. Uh, please keep listening. Um, uh, contact ships coming in the mail uh so just yeah keep tight we'll be back in january and we love you well we'll be back next week with the holiday special we'll be back next week the holiday special and then we'll be back in january we do love you yeah so much uh and and as always may the force be with you may the force be with you. oh you know what let's not end here let's get ben back in here oh you want to go get him yeah should we get ben a christmas present while we're while we're here <laughs> will you go get ben please? but no this is the last thing we should talk about before he comes back in should we get him a christmas present sure we should get him something right you handle it he likes hats will you go get him i need to pee Hey guys, it's me, David Sims. Griffin is literally. Oh, hey, wow. Uh, so, uh, ben, ben, we're all done. Ben, we're all done. Any final thoughts you want to share? <laughs> uh, we went long. How long did we go, Ben? I'm going to guess know. close to two hours. Well, take a look at our. Uh, I think it was like 145, is my guess, but we had a lot to talk about. You uh, almost did two hours. Nice. Uh, do I have any final thoughts? Um, no, I don't know. Uh, everyone well, have a happy... Yeah, have you had a nice year with us? Oh, uh, Absolutely, guys. Uh, it's been great to develop this idea with you and see it uh, grow into this great franchise known as Griffin and David Presents. I see so many great things down the road for us. Oh, come on. Uh, no speed bumps, though. Nothing but smooth sailing. Okay, we like smooth sails. Love those smooth sails. I think I might cut this part out. No, no we're going to keep it. Uh, keep it, keep it right, in. You said you weren't going to cut anything out of this episode. Um, uh, what what did you get up to while you were out? <laughs> well, uh, it was a, a smoke. I had a smoke. It was an employee, a uh, co-worker's um, birthday. So I got a free lunch. I got a hamburger and hey. some fries from Shake Shack. Wow. Very nice. Wrote some emails. Uh Got some fun new podcasts coming out in the next year. Hey, and, you know, just remember to keep rating and reviewing and subscribing to our podcast, Please but do. also That's sister right. podcasts on the UCB Comedy Network. Yep. Uh, so that was really, that was what I was doing for the last two hours. Well, I already did a fake out ending, but now that you're back in here and order has been restored and, you know, the family's back together. <laughs> it's true, yeah. Do, do you want to take us out with an end as always, Ben? Uh, I'd love to. I never even got the chance. As someone who didn't hear any of the things we established in this episode. Yeah. Uh, and, as always, Harrison Ford is a fucking babe. Agreed. <laughs>